what are some of the cons about traditions that can hold a sport back in your opinion? Problems and issues that I see are instructors that are, they feel empowered. Like I should be in charge. So F you, we're doing it this way. Yeah. Or I'm a higher rank than you, so you have to do what I say. Here, here's a perfect example of it drives me nuts when I see it. People can't step onto a mat without permission. They have to wait. And it's like, first of all, they're a paying member. They should be able to bow on the mat if they need your attention and walk up to you and say hello. Like, I understand the need to apologize for being late. I don't understand the, hey, you have to stand at the edge of the mat until I look at you. That to me is a power trip. And that power trip being kind of like, reflects down in ranks where it's like you'll get a purple belt that says no you're going with me i'm a higher rank to a blue belt that had a round with a white belt if he wants to go with you he'll go with you you have every right to ask he has every right to refuse this isn't like a because you're a higher rank you get to control everybody underneath you if your boss were to come to you and say guess what you're not going home to dinner tonight because i'm in charge you're staying here and you're working overtime you tell him to fuck off why as a purple belt in the room do you feel like you get to tell that guy exactly what he gets to do and not doing who he has to train with sometimes people in martial arts can get this sense of like authority over others that they shouldn't have Welcome back to the BJJ Fanatics Podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Ford. My guest today is a sixth degree black belt in judo. He's also a first degree black belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. He's a judo Olympic silver medalist, the third American male in history to make silver. He's also a three-time judo Pan Ams champion, and he represented Team USA three times in the Olympics. Uh, he runs his own successful academy, the Fuji Gym in Boston, Massachusetts. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to be joined today for the fourth time on the podcast by Travis Stevens. How are you today, Travis? I'm doing great. Happy to be back. It's great to have you back, my friend. I think it's been it's been about two years since we've had you on the show. So catch us up, man. What have you been up to since 2022? Uh, you know, a little bit of everything, but primarily focused on business and helping people get better at grappling, whether that's providing the right gi and gear or instructionals and techniques or mental strength, preparation and training and planning, you know, a little bit of everything. That's excellent. Well, that's, those are primarily the things I wanted to pick your brain on today. So that's awesome. That, that's awesome that you're already kind of in the mode in your day-to-day -day life doing that stuff anyway. Travis, last time you were on the show, you expressed some frustration and concern for the future of judo in America. You, you highlighted the challenge of finding talent to represent USA Judo in recent years. And you talked about how you and Jimmy Pedro together are taking action to do something about it through the American judo system that the two of you formed. Has there been any improvement at all over the last couple of years? Are you, are you feeling more hopeful for USA Judo? as we move closer to the Olympics in 2028? No, I think we're, we're in a point of no return. We are into our dark days as a country. So what's, what's happened, and I just got back from the senior nationals, I think it was like a month or two ago, and the biggest takeaway, and I remember talking to Colton and Marty and a lot of other people about this, is because there's no future, like there's no outcome for people, they're struggling to stick around, you know? And until the country can band together and figure out what that future looks like, they're going to struggle to keep people involved in the sport. You know, our senior nationals, the best we have in the country to compete athletically. In the finals, we fought three cadets, so kids between the ages of 15 and 17, we fought a couple of brown belts and we're talking like not oddball divisions. You know, our men's hundred kilos, so 220 pounds and under was fought by a guy in his forties and a kid who is 15 or 16 years old and the 15 and 16 year old won. So you're telling me that in the entirety of the United States, that's the best we could produce. And we go back to, you know, 
when I was an athlete and we go back to like 2016, 2017, even earlier, if you go back to like 2015, 2014, it's like those kids at that age group were 12 to 15 years old. So our country between a 12 and 15 year old and to 25 to like 28 is non-existent in the country. They didn't stick around. They're not training. They're not competing because they've decided to move on with their life. And the one thing that jujitsu does better than most other sports, especially when we're looking at combat sports, not necessarily martial arts, because I don't think they do as good a job as some of the other martial arts, but for sports aspect is they provide an avenue for adults to participate in an economic way or in a entrepreneurship kind of way. You know, there are a lot of people out there who are working, you know, we'll call it like the nine to five jobs, whether it's blue collar or white collar that love jujitsu, they love the benefits, they derive a lot from like the martial arts principles of the sport when it comes to like community, self-preservation, protection, honesty, like there's some type of moral compass in the sport that like gets pushed down to people where it's like, dude, you're just not a good person. And those people tend to like weed themselves out because the morality within martial arts tends to like gravitate towards the community and that hierarchy tends to like stick it allows a guy to go you know what i want to do this for a living and here's the blueprint to making a six-figure income while providing for my family my kids myself and also the community i think a lot of people miss that when it's like a martial arts school's like core concept and function is to make the community that they're located in a better place whether that's through like safety, whether that's through like anti-bullying practice, whether that's through like athletic, when we're talking about like health and wellness, like forget like who can do the best arm bar. Like there's a more, a moral and community driven aspect to this sport that a lot of people really dive into, which really helps facilitate the growth of the sport. And judo is missing that component we talked about it last time where a kid who is 15 years old is not even presented with the idea or the plan of like what are you going to do after high school what are you going to do after college like do you really want to go work a nine to five or become a starbucks barista or work at the local mcdonald's you know where the average income in america is roughly around like 50 to seventy thousand dollars which is baffling for a lot of people to hear, but that's like middle America, right? That's the middle class. And it's it's one of those things where like, if you just were trained properly, you were taught how to train staff, you were taught how to run a class, you were taught how to teach, and you weren't taught to like fight and win, the sport would grow exponentially, especially in that that area. And then once the sport for judo, let's say grows exponentially, the level and the pool of athletes you could pick from would triple, quadruple, 10x, which would give you a better chance of competing on the world stage. You know, one of our biggest problems is that the athletes that we have that we're competing with are not the best athletes. And that's myself included. I was fortunate enough to where I wouldn't consider myself like the best overall athlete, but because I was in a sport where there weren't real, let's call talented athletes competing. It gave me the chance to grow and build into it where I got the experience and stuff I needed in order to compete. And jujitsu, because it's so young, it has that same kind of taste, but 90% of the sport, you know, centers around the other part of it, which is like the martial arts side, which is community driven, you know, we're going to build a group of people around our dojo that are all like-minded, that all have a good moral compass, and we're all here to, like, self-improve. Then you have the 10% of the schools that are, like, actively competing. We're going to be the baddest people on the planet, and we're going to pound our chest and walk around town like we're tough guys. 
judo tends to focus more on the competition side and less on the community side, which is where we really struggle. If every jujitsu school in the country treated everybody who walked through the door like, dude, you got to get ready to go to the Olympic Games. That's your goal. That goal is so hard to obtain that you would lose everybody in the sport, which is where we're at. You know, if I told you like, hey, you have to become a billionaire, a billionaire. Otherwise, don't bother going to work. We would live in a community of poverty because you just you can't operate with that mentality. Less than 1% of the world's population can call themselves Olympians. 1% of that 1% can call themselves Olympic medalists. So when you dangle that carrot that is like so far out there that's hard to get, people start to realize like, can I do this? Do I want to do it? Do I have the resources to do it? The financial means, the motivation. There are so many factors that go into like, can you do this? That are so much out of your control. There's got to be something else to keep these people in the sport. And where judo really struggles is the people in the sport always fall back to, oh, well, we got to get it in the school systems like wrestling. And I'm like, guys, like you couldn't facilitate that even if you tried. You could take every person who's ever put a gi on in the country for the sport of judo and you couldn't put them in every middle school or elementary school in the country, even if you could afford to relocate all of their families. That's how small the sport is. But they can't get rid of that idea of that's where we need to be. But when you look at sports like Taekwondo, Karate, BJJ, that are none of which involved in the school system, all flourishing with these business models of community, moral compass, brick and mortar location, where the guy who opens up the brick and mortar location like does it full time because it's how he provides for his family. That idea is like so foreign to the judo market. It makes it really hard to grow a business and grow the sport. Yeah, that, that, that is really interesting what you're saying here because judo judo is such a great art for, for, for personal development and work ethic. I mean, man, it, it seems to me that that is a pretty serious cultural obstacle that you're describing here where, where you, you can't seem to get the community into starting a brick and mortar school to where they would just service the community. I love the idea that you mentioned the importance of, of how martial arts schools service the community and they make better people. And obviously they take psychopaths like you and I off the streets and ironically put us in padded rooms. So it's kind of like, you know, but it really does like there, there really is a sense of community around the business model of jujitsu and a lot of martial arts. And it's, it's interesting that there's that cultural obstacle for judo because judo is so beneficial for people. I remember having a conversation with the head of the IJF and their marketing department and they really they really sat down and like looked at judo because their goal is global dominance, right? They want judo to be the most popular sport in the world, the most watched sport in the world. And that's, if it can like chip away at that and make them win on that front, they get behind it. And when he sat down and he looked at it, he looked at all the other sports and this is going to be a wildly controversial topic, but what he noticed was judo had the best around overall athletes. When you look at like their athletic ability, their strength and conditioning, their mobility and their ability to do other sports well. And then you hear you hear like the argument of like every wrestler will be, well, that's not true. Wrestling is the best sport. And that's because they look at it through a compass of the USA wrestling, right? Yes. USA wrestling is inside the top 1% of 1% of athletic ability in sports in general. But when you look at wrestling as a whole and the 36 or 40 countries that compete competitively in wrestling, there's not that many that produce athletes inside the 1%. When you look at judo that competes 130 to 140 countries where 50 to 60% of those 140 can actively compete in, for medals in certain weight classes, right? You might see a country like Slovenia only have one or two athletes, but they have somebody that is inside that top 1% of athletic achievement for their country. 
Then you look at countries like Hungary has one. You look at Belarus. You look at Russia that has a full team. You look at France that has a full team. When you look at wrestling, there's really only a few countries that can compete. Same thing with jiu-jitsu. It's only a few countries that are really competitive because the sport doesn't pull out from a young age that athletic ability. And they were struggling because the sport for judo requires us to wear gis that are baggy in order to facilitate the action of the sport. And they were trying to play around with these ideas of how do we get people that aren't involved in the sport to understand how difficult and athletic the athletes really are. And when you, when I was at the 2012 Olympics, there was this, it was like a meme that was floating around the internet. It was all over Instagram at the time. And this guy had this brilliant idea and he was like, you should take a weekend warrior dad, right? In every sport. And they should get a free shot at the Olympics. Like you run track and field. Like I want you to put you in the hundred meters and I want you to run it. So people could like really gauge and see a difference. And in sports where it doesn't make that much sense are timed events, which are what Americans love because it's easy for us to understand like you are faster than the other guy by the clock. People understand weightlifting because it's like I can go to the gym and I'm like, dude, I can't deadlift 500 pounds. I get how difficult and how impressive that is. Where jujitsu and judo really struggle is you don't know how difficult it is to take somebody down that is in the top 1% of global performance preventing you from trying to take you down, right? And it has this like allure of like, well, everybody thinks they can do it, so it's not that impressive. Where like everybody can go hit a golf ball and realize they can't hit it 400 yards. You can't grab somebody that's inside the top 1% of their field and know what it feels like to really struggle and how physically dominant they are when it comes to fighting another human. And that's where judo really struggles and they're trying to figure out how to like crack the code of showcasing like the athletic ability and strength of a judo player in the in the ability of like I can pick up another human under full resistance by them over my head and throw you to the ground as hard as I want. That's a challenge. Wrestling gets away with like the singlet a little bit because you're like, you look at that guy and you're like, dude, that guy looks fucking strong. And you're like instantly in our brains, it's triggered. Like you're like, holy fuck, that guy looks like a beast. He intimidates me. But when you throw the gi on, you don't see that. Like they toyed around with ideas of like, what if we had all the men and women walk out to the mat without their gi tops on so you could see like if you've ever seen like a photo of like Iliadis without his gi top on after training you're like that guy's fucking scary right like if you've ever had like a real judo player just fucking grab you you're like holy fuck that's like a different level of like intimidation and fear that they feel like they could break you and then you take that and you throw in like the speed and aggression in which like submissions are done throws are done and you're like that's scary jiu-jitsu tends to dial that back down and focus on like a conditioning aspect of the sport that's more elongated when it's like hey we're gonna fight for 10 minutes that's like a completely different conditioning system and strength and conditioning terms of like you have to train differently for that you know your guy that runs the 100 meters can't win against a guy who proficiently trains at the mile. And that's kind of how like the difference of judo and jiu-jitsu works. But they're struggling with trying to get that athleticism like out into the public where they can see it. And during COVID, they tried to do all these like challenges, I think they were, of like, hey, can you do this? Like, do you have the same mobility as this 73 kilo athlete? Do you have the same ability to climb a rope like this 100 kilo guy? And they were toying around with these ideas and it they're struggling a little bit to get that across, to show parents and coaches how much judo can impact their athletic ability if they start judo at a young age and even transfer into a different sport. A lot of the higher level 
wrestlers that compete in Fargo, they win state championships, they win in the lower levels of wrestling. A lot of them have judo backgrounds because judo helps athletes become more athletic because of its dynamic ability and like picking people up, throwing people, standing on one leg, standing on one leg while holding another person in the air under control. And then when you take that athletic ability and those motor skills and you transfer them into another sport where the athletes don't have that, they're going to outperform them tenfold. And then where they lose it is they can't keep up with the technical ability inside the next sport. You'll see a lot of them drop off because they get that early success with judo and then they forget like, hey, I actually got to learn how to like really wrestle. Like the judo tricks won't work at the highest level in wrestling no different than like judo tricks don't work at the highest levels of jujitsu and vice versa. You were talking about the strength and conditioning of judo athletes. I'll never forget the first time I experienced that firsthand. I was a blue belt and I was visiting Brazil for the first time. And I went to a, uh, to De La Hiva's Academy in Rio de Janeiro. And there was a, uh, his name is Helvesio Pena. He was an older uh, 60 plus uh, former judo national champion. He grabbed my gi. I'll never forget this. He grabbed my lapel. We shook hands. Super nice guy. He grabbed my gi and my lapel and rotated his wrist to, to take out all the slack. Dude, my <laughs> gi started making, my gi made a sound. It was like, eh, like the fibers of my gi were making a sound. And I, I was just like, dude, holy shit. So I grabbed his hand. I'm trying to break his, it, I, the Statue of Liberty might as well have been grabbing my gi. It, his <laughs> gi, his grip was not moving. And this guy was 60 plus years old. And then other people that I've had the, the privilege to train with since then that were judo, judokas, uh, for, a couple guys from Russia, guys from around the world. They, the, the physicality and the strength of those guys is unbelievable. So yeah, everything you're saying is, is, is something that really does need to be showcased a little bit more. I think that would help a little bit if people could see that, like you said. Yeah, it's really hard to gauge. Even when you watch jujitsu, sometimes it's like watching paint dry. But like when you participate, you understand there's like so much isometric back and forth that's really challenging that can't be portrayed to the viewership. So jujitsu is a really difficult sport to watch and televise because you need to like, A, understand and like the people who are doing it. And B, you have to have a respect for the position and what's going on. MMA gets away with it because of the, hey, this guy could get KO'd or like kicked in the head and knocked out really quick. You know, some, some really slow arm bar that took a guy four and a half minutes to like creep his way to get, not that exciting. Judo, if you could get people into a country like the U.S., like really dived into competing and training and fighting, your ability to market and publicize it for viewership would be far greater than any other sport because it would give you that like knockout ability of like smashing someone to the ground, picking somebody up, laying them out in like a flip of a switch. And same thing with like the transitions on jumping onto chokes, jumping onto arm bars, where you could recreate that over and over and over again. That's why those accounts on social media that all they do is clip out big throws, they get to like a half a million followers super quick just because they find all the big throws and they just clip them out, clip them out. You would just have a rule set that got them to fight that way. I was just going to say, I wonder, have you seen this, the whole karate combat thing, uh, com- uh, karate combat th- that like with the, with the bowl shaped ring. Mm-hmm. I wonder if something of that nature with judo would be, would be, uh, to me, that would be really appealing because if you have like, like a league of guys where they're competing, say for cash prizes and things like that, and it's presented in a, in, in sort of an MMA esque type presentation, uh, or like a fight to win stage kind of thing. It would be cool because th- the thing about judo that's so, that I love so much is it's, it's, it's a, art of such great consequences for, for calcul for errors in calculation it, with, with, with jujitsu, you can get taken down, you can get scored upon, you can get positionally dominated, but then you can still fight and escape and re- turn things around in judo. If you get thrown, that's it. It's over. You lost. And so I, I think that people, the average person who's watching a sport, I think could resonate with that a little bit easier than say, like you said, watching a guy creep towards an arm bar in jujitsu for four minutes before he gets it. A guy getting thrown and hit with the earth. I mean, that's, that's, that's cool for anybody to watch. And I, maybe, maybe it's just the presentation could be changed somehow. Yeah. It's, it's a whole safety challenge issue where like the last thing you want is some guy's head getting stuck between like a corner post. Like if you look at my gym behind me, we can't train judo here because 
we lose an entire, I think it's like three meters. I can't do judo within three meters of those walls. So by the time you cut that off, right? Because if I throw you and your leg hits that wall, your ACL, LCL, it's gone. If I throw you and your head gets hit it's that wall, like, and I pull with all my force, like your neck's getting folded in half, right? So there are a lot of like things because we're talking about full body, full explosive, like no, there's no stopping the action once it starts. You're you're committed to this, and it's the only way at the highest levels to like really get these things to work. And it creates a scary, a scary environment. Yeah. Maybe it could be just like a, a huge open mat of some kind. I, I don't know. Yeah. I just, it's, it seems to me like the appeal of judo, if presented in a certain way for the average person, could be really cool, whether they watch MMA or combat sports or not. It's like, okay, I get it. One guy has to throw the other guy. If you make the mistake and you get tossed, that's it. You're, it it's over. And then that guy moves up. And then eventually at the end of the night, there's there's a winner, like a Grand Prix kind of thing. Yeah. That could be pretty, that could be pretty appealing, I think. There was a... Uh... There used to be a league, well, it still exists. It's called the Bundesliga in Europe. And they used to do a really phenomenal job. And I used to fight for a team called TSV Oppensburg. And their setup was awesome because they had like a one, a one competition square, full regulation size. And what they did was they brought the fans right to the edge. Ooh. So the fans worked as like a, a natural barrier from like going out of bounds and not out of bounds and the referees didn't follow the rules as strict as like an IJF thing would have, especially for these local ones. They're still within the rules, but it's like, hey, cross gripping is illegal at three to five seconds. They'll let it slide to like six or seven to give you like the ability to showcase something for the crowd because they're trying to be entertaining while staying true to the roots. So the, the rules are kind of embellished a little bit, I would say. They're not as strict. Partly because I think the refereeing isn't at that higher level, but you need something that like brings people like a basketball court, like right up into it where they're still technically in out of bounds. But when they are out of bounds, it gives that feel of like being a part of it. That would help. That is cool. That's a really cool idea. You know, Travis, I, I recently interviewed Shintaro Higashi and he said something I found really interesting. I'd like to get your thoughts on this. He said that he felt that jujitsu athletes who wanted to really commit themselves to dedicating to judo could be in an interesting position to potentially make Team USA for the Olympics in the future. And I thought that was really interesting because if you think about it, let, let's say you have a young athletic advanced jujitsu player who really dedicates himself for the next three or four years to judo. It'd be interesting to see how far he could get into the qualifiers. And it, it also reminded me of something you've said in the past uh, that much of the world ignores the Nawaza side of judo and that you think that's where Americans could really have a competitive advantage. What are your thoughts on the idea of recruiting young jiu-jitsu athletes to represent Team USA for judo in the future? I mean, I know a lot of people are going to get upset at me for saying this, <laughs> but um, there's, there's obviously no guarantees in sport, right? But the the thing that Shintaro said is is true. You can't you can't argue with it. But there there is a massive difference between an Olympian and an Olympic medalist. Ninety percent of the Olympic Games is vacation. Right? Like let's I, I'm going to use track and field just because it's like an easy one. You could use swimming. But when you show up to the 100 meters, you know you're not winning. Like you you know that when you show up to that race, you cannot run the time that Usain Bolt can run. You also know that, you know, the guy who's going to take second, like, you know you can't run that time. So same thing with weightlifting, like if the guy who lifts, lifts 20 kilos more than you, like, you know, you're not winning. Those people go to the Olympics because the sport allows them to, because they're time-based, you know, you can't do it because they're trying to get IOC dollars into the sport. They're going to represent their country, which is great because it helps uplift, you know, countries when it comes to like gathering around sport but they're going to compete for their personal best 
knowing full well they have no shot at meddling. So <laughs> by like the third night at the Olympics, half the village is in party mode because you just know you can't compete. You know, so it's it's a little different for everybody. I would say most of the people in jiu-jitsu that are competing at the highest level of jiu-jitsu, whether it's gi or no gi, could make Team USA in LA. Right now. Right now. Wow. Like, if you wanted, like, just for argument's sake, I could take Victor Hugo at heavyweight. I could probably grab, like, Nicky Rod at hundreds. You know, you could probably grab, you know, at this point it's like arbitrary, but you could grab like part of the B team. You could grab like the Rutolo brothers because you're talking about in order to qualify for LA, you don't need to go on the world circuit. You only have to be the best in the US. So if you were to throw it into a trials like top eight in the country, which is easy to do because I just got done saying that we have brown belts and cadets winning at our nationals. You know, 80% of the field for our senior nationals are fought by juniors and cadets or masters. There's not actually a lot of like adults competing. So you're taking like people who compete in the top 1% of their field in one area who are athletic, who have an understanding of strategy and winning in a competitive stance by the time you show them a little bit of gripping and get them a little bit comfortable on their feet with like one or two throws, like it, it's all strategy at that point. It would be easy piece of cake. And then they would show up to LA, they would get their gear, they'd get their ass kicked and then they would go home and they'd all be Olympians and they'd go back to making dollars in jujitsu. And you could probably get all that done in like three years. Like if they all wanted to, like after Paris, be like, hey, we're going to hang up jujitsu and we're all going to become Olympians, piece of cake. Because there's just no one for them to compete against, which is part of the problem. Now, let's say you take someone like those names you dropped, like uh, J-Rod or, or Nicky Rod. If you took the Rotolo brothers and guys guys like that who, who have a good grappling base and who can wrestle, uh, what would it take to get them from being Olympians to Olympic medalists it, it, do, do you feel you like couldn't already, do it there wouldn't be enough time so, yeah, so you're, you're, ta you're talking this would have to be development from a really young age like like you see for ncaa type wrestlers you, you need to get them in like real young basically you can't say necessarily it's they would have to start younger because there are people who could do it older it would all come down to like their athletic ability which no one knows because at the end of the day all of their wrestling sucks right? There's not a good wrestler in jiu-jitsu. You know, there's there's none of these guys who compete in no-gi or compete in ADCC would ever join a freestyle US Open style wrestling thing and go win it. Their wrestling is just not on that level. They wrestle really good against each other, which is basically at like a middle school level. So you're taking grown men at a middle school, maybe a high school level wrestling, but I doubt that because I guarantee you if you took like a California state champ, a Penn state champ, a New Jersey state champ and threw them into a, just a pure wrestling based match, the jujitsu guys couldn't compete. You know, don't forget like Nikki Rod was a D3 wrestler, not even D1, not even like world level, world class freestyle wrestling. And then you threw him in, I think he wrestled, um, what was that guy that did that match with? Pat Downey. Pat Downey. That didn't go well. And Pat Downey's not even like the top 1% of wrestling in the world. Like he's not world champ. He's not Olympic champ. He's not Olympic medalist. He's just like a competitive person, kind of like a gateway person when you're looking at who's going to compete at the highest level. There's levels to this that the higher you go, the harder it is to get to that next stage and the bigger the gap. You know, like your ability to go from like white belt to blue belt is easy, right? But your ability to go from brown belt to black belt is harder. There's just a certain level of like experience you needed. And then once you get to that stage, your ability to go 
national level competitor to world level competitor to Olympic level, like consistent medalist in order to have the skill set needed to compete at the Olympics. That's wildly difficult. I mean, you're, you're talking about like taking a guy who's 20 years old and he's got to go win the U S open in golf in three years. Like we're, we're like, and it, it's physically somebody is preventing you from swinging the club at the same time. You know, when you throw like the groundwork aspect into it, there's always this realm of like, yeah, you might be able to win. We have a U.S. competitor right now, Jack Unesca, who's got a couple of slick moves on the ground and he has a couple of medals. None of those medals are by beating anybody inside the top five, nor has he come close to beating anybody inside the top five. So you could squeak out medals here and there, but to show up at the Olympics and be like, the world thinks I'm going to win completely different ball game. Hands down. That's, that's precisely what I was curious about is whether or not, whether or not someone who's at the elite level in jujitsu could use the Nawaza side as, as their strategy. But even, even then you think that would be a, a pretty, a pretty far stretch, huh? It would be a, a massive undertaking and a challenge, right? Like, it, how do I want to put this? Like, you know, when you're, when you talk to people about the difference between like a black belt in jujitsu and a blue belt or a purple belt in jujitsu, they get into an MMA fight, like their jujitsu is at the same level, right? Because the blue belt and purple belt needs to know just enough to not get caught because he can always just get back up. Well, same thing with being on the ground, like your ability to get someone on the ground is wildly difficult. Like if, if you're trying to figure it out and you want to test the, just test it, grab like a somewhat strong blue belt from your club and have your black belt try this. Okay. I want you to tell the blue belt to just lay prone on the ground, face down, and they can cover up as tight as they want right? They can grab their collars, they can squeeze, they can do whatever they want. I want you to sub that person in sub 10 seconds. Try to pull that off. Now do that again and again and again and again and again and see how many times you can get them after 20 tries. See, every time, and you have to start from your feet, person's laying prone in front of you. When that buzzer dings, you got to get on top of them and they have to be tapped in 10 seconds. Can you do that? That'll show you like the level of physicality and 10 seconds is even on the long side, right? So when we talk about judo newaza and the ability to transition, a lot of it has to do with like what types of throws are you doing on your feet to how you're landing on the ground to what you have to start with once you hit the ground inside that 10 seconds and knowing how to use those things and get there from your feet to the floor is where the challenge lies. So you've got to hit the Nawaza on the transition on the way down, which means your takedowns have to be good enough to bring the person down in the first place. Yeah. And it has to be, make them fear enough where they are actively trying to prevent it and not stall the clock out. Yeah. Because That's, don't forget, if you can't advance in three to four seconds on the ground with progression, the referee understands it's Mate, we're back up to our feet. Like, here's another one, right? Like, start and close guard. I want you to open the guard, pass the guard, get chest-to-chest -chest contact and side control in six seconds. Show me. And then start to feel your heart beat and like that pumping, like, that's judo for five minutes. Like, let's let's see what you can really do. And then I challenge you in half guard. Like, let that person lock your legs, start there, buzzer go, six seconds, pass the guard and pin him. Six seconds. And then you'll start to understand your technique is garbage and you need a lump of violence to be thrown into the mix with your technique in order to get through that position in six seconds. I know I can do it. Because I know I can get out of your closed guard. I can get past your legs. Even if you belly down, I know what to look for in order to turn you to get chest to chest and pinned you. 
in 10 seconds, six seconds. Like I know how to turn you in sub 10 seconds to get a pin from my feet to the floor. But like, that's not how jujitsu is taught. So it would take a complete reworking of the brain and not everybody is mentally capable of implementing that type of violence on another person in order to get them to turn and give up in that amount of time. It's a, it's a different type of training that they're not necessarily used to. I think most of them are capable of it. It's just going to take a little bit of like reworking to, in order to pull it off. That makes sense. Yeah. Let me reframe my question. So if judo, if judo in the U S is kind of on life support, as you, as you've made it sound, and we're looking for short-term solutions, that's kind of difficult. What about the long, what about the long game? Do you, do you think that a connection between the jujitsu community and the judo community could result in a cultural long game where, where we have, where you, where you guys are, where we're adding more people into, into the, into the, the pool of athletes to choose from? Uh, is, is, is there, do you think there's any benefit of connecting the two communities together to getting more people to pursue judo seriously and fill up some of those numbers and spots across the country? Uh, I think it's a little bit of a challenge. Um, I don't think, and this is just my, my gut instinct. Judo is driven by your, I want to say like you're 16 and up. I don't think jujitsu has a huge base. When you look at like where we're at on like a global scale of, Hey, how many, how many 10 year olds are there doing jujitsu? Like really? Like when you look at like pan kids versus like world masters, like wildly different numbers. And then you look at where all these kids are coming from, where I don't think jujitsu as a sport is fun for kids because it's not as push pull fighting on our feet, running around. It's a lot of like sitting. I think there are really good schools out there that do a really good job with kids programs but I think a lot of people struggle to articulate and teach kids jujitsu that are like four, five, six years old on like a long-term basis. But uh, I don't know where the numbers are to see if you could get enough people into judo to really pull those numbers over. Because judo on a, on a professional level is professionalized at 15. 15, 16. At that point, like you're on your path to like the Olympics. So if we're waiting till people get to be 15, 16 years old to start, you're going to struggle long term because, and it's where we are at today, and it's where I was. Like by the time they get enough mat time overseas and enough training time competition experience understanding that person's not really competitive until they're like 24 25 but like in america like you're like a decade in like the working realm of like where does your paycheck come from like how do i support a family how do i have kids you push that off until you're later on in life which is part of the reason why people leave the sport because most people aren't willing to give that up on the hopes or maybe I can win an Olympic medal. And even if I did, what do you get for it? Nothing. Nobody has ever like monetized an Olympic medal in the sport of judo. Not even Kayla. She went directly to MMA where she's monetizing it. Yeah, she used it to like get her foot in the door and do other things, but judo is not really a monetized outcome. So I'm not sure people when they're doing jujitsu would want to make that transition to have the title of Olympian or Olympic gold medalist when there's not an ability to monetize it above what they could already do by being a BJJ black belt, which is open up a school. So like, why would you make that transition? There's been a lot of people talking over the years about jujitsu 
whether or not jujitsu will ever be in the Olympics. A lot, it's kind of a split down the middle where some people think it would be cool and other people think it would be a terrible idea. Um, you mentioned that one of the issues with growing judo as an art and, and, and that's something that the, that, the, that the community of judo suffers from is, is that there's not people who go and open schools and there's not people who then, uh, after competing, um, go into a, 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 a business model of opening a school and, and, and servicing a community. And you also mentioned that when you do go into a judo club, usually you're met with, hey, we're going to, rather than we're going to, this is a vehicle for you for personal development. This is going to be something that we're going to try to get you to be in the Olympics someday. And you mentioned that that can turn a lot of people off over time. Do you feel that ultimately judo being part of the Olympics has been detrimental for the art itself, for the growth of it? Um, I guess we're apples and oranges because he, judo is the number two sport in the world. So there's there's no lack of growth. I, I'm sorry, I meant in the USA. I apologize. Yeah, yeah that's the, where it's like it's got to have that little caveat to it. Yeah, sorry about that. Right, and I've had the I I flew all the way to Brazil to meet with the IJF just about this like particular issue because sport for the people who don't understand like your average Americans who play baseball, football, whatever, on a global scale sports are governed by government they are not they are not like you see in the states where like oh who's gonna coach your son's little league oh this dad's gonna volunteer this season like that's not a thing in the rest of the world like if you wanted to be a little league coach in like let's say france you would have to have a degree you'd have to have gone to school for sport development and sport management or some other degree, you would have to write a thesis to get a coaching license. And then you'd have to take that license once you got it. And you'd have to apply to be a coach in a city. Then that city would fund your salary in order to facilitate that sport in whatever city you are applying for. Right. And now you work as a government employee for the city in order to facilitate that sport. And usually the city has, in our case, dojos or fields or sports centers where coaches go to work, right? In the town where I did judo for Germany in TSV Abensburg and Abensburg, Abensburg paid the coach inside the sports center to teach judo out of the sports center. The city paid for the mats, the city space for the venue, the city pays for these things that you don't have to worry about funding. So it's very difficult when the sport is governed by people who have this ideology of like, hey, we have to get into government. We have to get the right person in play. You've got to get somebody on this committee inside your state. That way you can get the funding for sport to go down the thing. And it's like, we don't operate in that realm. So it's hard for Americans to understand when you're going up against that, we have to do things differently. So sports that aren't necessarily governed by the Olympics are a little bit easier to grow because people get it. It's done a little differently. They're okay with it. They don't have to answer to like big brother on like, why aren't you doing things like we do things? And it's like, because I can't, <laughs> it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. And then you look at some of the sports that do do really well, like baseball used to be an Olympic sport, but it goes in and out of the Olympics because it's not that popular, but it's popular here. And they have a business model that makes sense here. Wrestling really popular here. Olympic level sport almost got kicked out because it's not that popular in the rest of the world. And that's because that sport isn't focused on growing globally. The problem we have is our national governing body, which everybody is required to have in order to be a part of the IOC, which people don't get when they answer the question of like, how do we get judo into the, or jujitsu into the Olympics? Well, first you guys all got to follow the same rules. Can't, can't fly by the seat of your pants anymore, which is a challenge in the U S where jujitsu flourishes. And where it's really struggle, struggling in places like France, Portugal, England, because there's not this overseeing body telling you like, hey, 
I have to go to the government. Hey, I have to get the government funding. I have to understand sport. I have to fight with baseball and basketball and cricket and all these other places to get money to funnel it down, to pay the coaching, to pay the travel, to get the teams. It's not this private entity that you see in the States. And when you go to all the local business owners in jiu-jitsu and you go to like the Gracie Bajas and you go to the Alliance and you go, hey guys, guess what? We're going to go to the Olympics. You're not in charge anymore. They're not your athletes. They're my athletes. You can't run your organization the way you want to because you have to follow my rules. Everybody goes, whoa, 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 whoa. We can't have that. But I want to go to the Olympics. It's like this massive trade-off of like control, not control, private business, not private business, non-for-profits. Like there's a whole structure to this that I don't think people understand. It's not just about numbers and countries. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that definitely is a, uh, a very complex thing that you're talking. It's a complex puzzle to solve. And I, yeah. I, I, one thing I think is great is, is that you and Jimmy Pedro are, are really doing what you can. You're making a great grassroots efforts to, to, to do what you can. I, I really like the approach and the overall mission that you and Jimmy have. I, I like that you guys are really trying to systemize the way judo is taught. Uh, you're breaking a lot of traditional molds. So what, what you guys are doing is really innovative. In your opinion, what, what are some of the benefits of traditions in martial arts? Structure, I think, is the biggest one. Hierarchy is another. You know, like a lot of people just don't have structure in their like day to day lives. They kind of, how do I want to say, like, they decide, like, this is how I want to do things. So this is how I'm going to do things instead of this is the way that somebody who's been doing this for 20 years is telling us this is the best way to do it. So we're going to take what we want to do and kind of fit it into this space in order to be better later on. And as you start looking at like certain things like bowing on and off the mat, it's a simple task, but even guys in the military will tell you like, Hey, it's important that you make your bed every day. You know, it's important that you fold your gi after practice. It's important that you put your gi in a bag after every practice. It's important that you don't walk to the to the dojo in your gi pants. Like if you're one of those guys that get in your car from your house in your gi pants and then after practice you get right back in your car, like that's disgusting. Like don't ride public transportation in your gi pants and then get on the mat. Like there are certain things that it just like teaches you of like personal hygiene comes from martial arts. Like cut your fingernails, brush your teeth, shower before and after practice, like don't wear shoes on the mat. They're like, it teaches you like, hey, don't put things that you take outside and bring them inside because that's nasty. That leads to infections. That's not taught in every household in America. Like you'll see kids that play baseball, like grab their bags, grab their shoes, like traipse through the house, like play with mud they don't just like take everything off because they in their brains they get that like outside to inside is not healthy they're like little things that just like help people be just a little bit better in their day-to-day that's excellent now in contrast what are some of the some of the cons about traditions that can hold a sport back in your opinion uh it actually happens on the flip side where it's not it doesn't come from the new students coming into the sport. It happens when somebody has been in the sport and they push things down the ladder, right? So problems and issues that I see are instructors that are, how do I want to put this? Like, uh, uh, not control, but, um, they feel empowered like I should be in charge. So F you were doing it this way yeah. or I'm a higher rank than you. So you have to do what I say. Like here, here's a perfect example of it drives me nuts when I see it. People can't step onto a mat without permission. They have to wait. And it's like, first of all, they're a paying member. They should be able to bow on the mat if they need your attention and walk up to you and say hello. Hello. Like, I understand the need to apologize for being late. I understand the need for, like, 
hey, some schools have like, you got to do 50 pushups before you join class because you're late and it's a punishment. I don't understand the, hey, you have to stand at the edge of the mat until I look at you. Like that to me is a power trip. I don't like the, hey, you have to turn and face the wall, never tie your belt in front of me because it's disrespectful. Like, first of all, they're working hard because their belt came undone. Second off, you're a crappy instructor. If you didn't teach him when he was a white belt how to tie his belt properly and it keeps falling off, that's a reflection on you. B, if I'm teaching a technique and you have to fix your gi and you turn around the other way, I'm insulted because you're supposed to be paying attention, right? You're telling me that you're going to turn around and tie your belt. Then I guarantee you, you're going to ask me to teach it to you again because you didn't pay attention the first time. So which is it, right? The idea that like some people only allow people to fix their geese when they're kneeling, right? Like they're just weird, like power trip things that you see. And that power tripping kind of like reflects down in ranks where it's like, you'll get a purple belt that says, no, you're going with me. I'm a higher rank to a blue belt that had a round with a white belt. And it's like, you don't have control over that. Like if he wants to go with you, he'll go with you. You have every right to ask. He has every right to refuse. This isn't like a, because you're a higher rank, you get to control everybody underneath you. Like that's just ethically not fair, right? That's like, if your boss were to come to you and say, guess what? You're not going home to dinner tonight because I'm in charge. You're staying here and you're working overtime. You tell them to fuck off. So why as a purple belt in the room, do you feel like you get to tell that guy exactly what he gets to do and not doing who he has to train with? Or like, what if a purple belt goes up to the female and is like, you don't get to train with him. You're training with me. Like now it seems weird, right? Like, so there's like, sometimes people in martial arts can get this sense of like, authority over others that they shouldn't have there's one thing about running classes there's another thing about individual control when you're not lumping the thing you're trying to do as the whole for the classroom you know that i think can be an issue but that stems from like again like the assholes that are part of the community that like run bad schools or bad environments yeah travis what do you think is the worst advice you see given to young athletes (laughs) <laughs> wow the worst yeah something something common something commonly recurring that you've seen coaches advise young athletes that you just totally disagree with um are we talking about like sport sport specific like for jiu-jitsu it, or judo or it could it could be anything yeah it could be technique it could be it could be career trajectory it could anything at all that you, that you think is uh something that you've seen recurring among among uh coaches that you just really disagree with i'll give you a situation because this one this is something that happens to me and i actually have to have conversations with younger athletes that i deal with on mentally understanding to not be affected by it and what i see is i see coaches who don't care so much about athlete development they care more about winning medals and it's a it's definitely a fine fine line to like pay attention to but when you're trying to get an athlete to compete there are certain skills required in order to compete at certain levels And we're not talking about like, hey, my 16-year-old or my 18-year-old athlete is like trying to win this big IBJJF event or a junior national championships or whatever. We're not having those conversations. I'm talking about like young kids, like 10 years old, like eight years old, like they're new into the sport. They teach these kids like really advanced moves for their development set. I'll give you an example of what happens in judo. A coach will teach an athlete how to do like a fireman's carry at eight. That kid hasn't even learned all the 50 like standard throws of judo. Yet they've decided to take this throw out 
give it to this kid because it gives him a competitive advantage to win at local tournaments. And what happens is this kid learns these techniques at a very young age and they haven't used their development years to really like hone in on like balance, understanding the principles of how the throws work, understanding combinations, understanding like give and take in matches, understanding where to put their hands. They just teach them these like obscure practices because they're like, hey, this famous athlete does this move. I think you could get it to work. Let me bring what the one percenters are doing down to like, you can barely win the local match and I'm going to give it to you and we're going to train it. And then you're going to win this local tournament. When in reality, when we're talking about staying inside the country, you need a foundational base that's really strong. Once you have a really strong foundation, adding those like little things into it, super easy to do. What's really hard to do is to take an athlete that has all these like high level, like twitches and flinches and techniques and get them to be like, Hey, you're losing because you don't know how to put your hands on the gi and like play defense. And then when you try to go back to the basics with an athlete that feels like they're advanced, they just want to throw in the towel and not do anything anymore. And so they have this ceiling that they're like stuck at because their foundation's not built strong enough to really grow on. And a lot of coaches take the easy road when it comes to athlete development and not forcing it. And they just keep adding techniques and adding more techniques and doing different techniques. And it's like, you're missing the whole foundational principle. Like your athlete looks like he has two left feet. Why is he doing this like combination over here that's really advanced at like a brown or black belt level? You know, like I see some like eight and 10 year olds like learning lasso and spider guard. And I'm like, he's eight. Like I I get it. He can get it to work, but like, There's all these like foundational principles like your kid can't do a takedown, your kid can't shoot a double, your kid can't grip fight, your kid doesn't know where to put his hands or like there's like things that like shouldn't be taught until later on but coaches that aren't that good at like developing athletes from point A to B, they like to grab those upper things and throw them in because it's easy wins, super easy wins. Like I could show an eight-year-old a trick and he could go throw the other eight-year-olds with it but it's like Now he relies on this trick. When the kid gets a little older and the trick doesn't work, he doesn't have a foundation to fall back onto to learn the other techniques that he needs to learn. And I see that all the time when I'm when I'm watching coaches learn. And it happens when I do like camps and clinics where they're like, Hey, can you teach all our athletes how you do it on San Agi? And I'm like, I could, but none of you will be able to do it at the end of the day. Technically, you'll be able to have somebody stand there and do it. But when it comes down to it through resistance and training and like timing, you're athletically not there. You can't do it. I can not even at my age now do the same Sayanagi I used to do when I was an athlete because I don't have that athletic ability anymore. Now that I have a gut, I'm not that strong anymore and I'm too slow. Like it's just the nature of the beast. Like you have to have a certain athletic ability to do certain things. And they teach above their age limit in order to get them to win at their age. So when they get to be senior level players, it's like now you're competing as a junior. And that's, and that's what happens in USA judo all the time, more so than jujitsu, where we win at the cadet level on a global stage. We win at the cadets. We can somewhat compete as juniors, but then when it comes time to compete as seniors, we still maintain the junior level judo that we had at success. We're not actively like developing and growing and changing because the athlete didn't do that from the ground up. Athletes should be evolving and changing all the time from a development stage, not a, hey, here's a new technique. Think about like, what did this technique do for the athlete that helped him learn a new skill or become a better athlete? not can he do this technique yes or no like if an athlete can't invert right in a jiu-jitsu sense like sure maybe a lasso will help teach that kid how to invert because it gives him something to push off of and hook around to teach him how to invert and roll 
right? But should an eight-year-old be inverting, yes or no? If the answer is no, then the lasso is not needed, right? So then it's not needed. So at what point should a kid know how to invert? Like what prerequisites are there in your curriculum that allow that athlete to then go on to learning how to invert? And people tend to just say, oh, for you, this is really good. And they throw it in there. And it's like, mm-hmm. you're giving a, you're giving that athlete that taste of what's up there. And he's not going to want to come back and learn what he needs to learn. And a lot of coaches struggle because I think it bores them as people. Like they don't like teaching the basics because it's boring. It's not like engaging for them mentally. And they don't like athletes struggling with the basics. That, that idea that you're talking about, about people either rushing through the fundamentals or mixing in lots of advanced stuff that's above their head when they're first starting is a real problem. And it's something that you, like I, I encounter um, people that are pretty highly ranked in jujitsu, like the, the advanced levels who are still like, yeah, man, I really got to go back and like refine this thing that I, that I keep fucking up, you know, that, that should have been resolved a long time ago. And, uh, I had a conversation a couple of years ago with, uh, with this white belt kid. Uh, when I say kid, he's like 20, uh, really good guy. And he, but you could tell he was studying a lot of stuff on YouTube and like pulling, you know, trying, trying, trying to do things that were, were a little advanced for where he was at. And he was able to like, for example, uh, develop a pretty good barambolo. Like he was able to hit the barambolo pretty well. The problem is he would take the back and then immediately lose back control. And so he would ask me one day where I was just sitting on the side of the mats after class. He's like, man, why do I, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do the barambolo and I'm doing it, but then I'm sudden, somehow it's not working. I said, dude, your, your barambolo is sick, dude. It looks good. It's it, technically you're doing it well. I said, the problem is, is I don't think your back control is where it needs to be. It's so like, I would really encourage you to focus on like understanding the alignment of the spines and like where your grips need to be and how to control the back. Cause if you're using this cool slick technique to get somewhere, but then immediately losing it, what's the point? You know what I mean? Like, and so I I think that a lot of people do run into that where they, where they, you know, they they start learning things a little, they put the cart before the horse, so to speak. And I remember, I remember our uh, Placido Santos, the BJJ fanatics guy, right? He used to train at my school in the afternoons all the time. And people used to ask me because he was a blue belt and he'd be like, Hey, how come you don't promote him to purple belt? He's got this really good heel hook. And like, he gets in these positions and I was like, I get it. He's good at that one thing. And I go, but he's a blue belt. I said, if you get past his legs and you put him in side control, he can't get out. So how do you promote somebody to purple belt if he can't get out of side control? And I go, he went down the rabbit hole at the time of like, I'm going to get really good at this footlock and he could tap black belts with a heel hook or, you know, a toe hold, you know, whatever he was doing at the time. And it's like, yeah. But if you keep him to the basics and you get past the ability of him doing that, he's a blue belt. So you can't just like, he's that same guy that like took that piece of information that was really advanced and ignored the basics because it excited him. And that's where coaches like allow the athletes to like go down that road. And I'll stop black belts and I'll be like, you don't need to know that right now. I get brown belts that come into my school and I'm like, okay, but you suck at the basics. Like you don't even understand the principles of shrimping right now. You just bench the person off them, throw you back and hope you get your knees inside. Like you don't even understand the core principle of like why you're supposed to move your hips when you move your shoulders versus your hips. And it's like, you got to kind of understand all these like little things so that you can apply the advanced things instead of like just trying to apply the advanced things and then wondering why you're getting stuck. How often do you see people getting away with, with something sloppy like that for a long period in, in, in training? Like, like you mentioned the brown belt that, that reaches a point where maybe it works for him a lot of times where he can just explode out of something or, or, or bench his way through uh, a side control. How often do you see someone that, that, that can get away with that for, for a while? All the time. Most people can. The, the way I explained it to people when we're talking is I want you as like, an athlete just go train with an aggressive athletic white belt right just just go train and then what i want you to do is i want you to just think about like anytime your brain triggers with like a let me recover just know that a good black belt beat you because you won't get that opportunity to recover if you ended up in a position where you instantly thought like oh that's bad for the smallest of seconds 
And when I train with white belts and they get like a two on one on my pant and I'm like, that's bad. That's inherently bad because if a guy who knows how to go two on one and has a really strong leg grab, he's beating me. My brain triggers that in my body. So I am aware of mistakes that I am making even at the lowest level where most people who are brown and black belts ignore it because they know they can recover on the back end. I recognize it on the front end and I'm aware of it. Most people ignore it on the front end, recover it on the back end and think it was no big deal. And that's where the disconnect lies for them because then when somebody who's really good gets there on the front end, then it can't recover. They think they need a new tool in the bag instead of addressing the front end of it. I was having a conversation with John years ago, years ago back when I was first starting to train and it kind of stuck with me ever since. And he was like, you never need more than three moves. You never need more than three, right? Because if I do A and it doesn't work, I go to B. And then if I do B and it doesn't work, I go to C. And if C didn't work, then I'm not good enough at A, B, or C. Because if I have to go down the rabbit hole of like all these like addressing points, then you clearly didn't do A good enough. B actually isn't even involved with A down like the list of things you should be doing because all techniques are interconnected, right? If we were to go into like weave passing, how do you go from weave passing to leg drag passing? At some point, there's a transition when you can go from system to system and you're clearly not understanding where those holes are and how they interconnect and you're skipping systems and you're getting stuck. So you're adding more things to your repertoire instead of improving the first three. You want to be super slick at these first three and don't go to four and five. And Gordon has made that point in a lot of things he said where he's like, well, we have moves like four, five, and six. I can't even get there because you guys suck so bad. I keep hitting you on steps one, two, and three. And it's like, that's that idea of like, It's okay to have four, five, and six, but like your focus and your priority is being so good at steps one, two, and three. It doesn't matter even if they know because they can't stop it. No different than when I do judo. I know when I put my hand on a specific part of the gi, I'm throwing you. The question is, are you getting out? But you're getting thrown. You are definitely going to hit the floor one way or another. And you have to have that mentality when when you're drilling and when you're improving of like, recognizing when you messed up and admitting it, right? The self-reflection and not being like, well, I got out anyway, so it's okay. It's not okay. And B, not adding complexities to your skill set that are above the basics. Hodger Gracie from Mount, basics, man. We learned that at white belt. He does it at black belt because the first couple steps, he's so fucking good at, it doesn't matter because you can't get out. But everybody has all these funny transitions and YouTube clips and all these things. That's only because you suck at the basics. It's the only reason why you're teaching that is because you suck at the basics and you feel like you need these fancy moves that people aren't aware. Guess what? When everybody becomes aware, you still suck because it's not going to work anyways because your basics suck instead of having that strong foundational base. Travis, one of my favorite things about talking to you is your blunt, unsugar-coated uh, advice, man. It's always appreciated, brother. I love it, man. Part, part of your methodology with your students is mindset and mental strength, and I'd love to cover this area with you. Um, it, it is, it's really common that we see visualization and goal setting uh, as things that are talked about in other sports. But, you know, obviously we can all daydream in our minds of becoming world champions in a sport, but how, how can someone specifically use visualization as an effective tool for success? Um, that's a, that's a challenging one because visualization only works when you have the skill set to pull it off. It's, it's like the, the cherry on top, right? It's the thing that's going to solidify your body from crumbling under the pressure of performing. It is not the thing that's going to make you better. 
you have to already have the skills to do whatever you're trying to do. The difference is, is can you do it under the pressure of performing? That's where visualization helps, right? You are not going to visualize your way to tapping Gordon Ryan. That, it, it doesn't, you're not going to visualize your way of making a billion dollars. That's, that's not a thing. And I think that's where people, you know, get caught up in like the hocus pocus of it versus like the reality of it. You know, like you, you still need to have that foundational part to you. That's real. Like, this is where I'm at. This is really where, where I believe I am. And this is what I really think I can achieve. If all of that is true and they're playing the same game, then visualization will help bring everything together so that you can have the desired outcome, right? But most people lie about where they really are. Most people don't use language that truly depicts where they are. And most people use language that is self-deprecating to their own performance and so when they're visualizing, they have all these contradictions inside their talk and inside their mind that doesn't produce an outcome that is desired. And you've really got to get all these things in line with each other in order to have visualization like truly work for you. You know, and you have to have the talk that goes along with it verbally to the universe, but also mentally in your own head that reinforces the visualization without all these things working together. They're just different pieces to different puzzles that are never going to go together. And that's where most people really struggle is they just, they can't admit to themselves where they really are. They can't admit or articulate where they need to go. Most people can't articulate like what improvement means to them. And most people visualize above where they truly are today, wondering why it's not working. You know, like using Conor McGregor as an example, like Conor dreamed of becoming a UFC champion. It's a dream because it's not based in reality. Then when he gets a UFC contract, he is still dreaming about being a UFC champion. It's not until he understands that he has the ability to win it by reality where like he's won fights in the UFC, he's knocked out top contenders. Now he's in a realm where like this is possible. Once you hit that realm of possibility, you anticipate success, which is where visualization comes in because when something's anticipated, it's happening. It's not a wonder. And most people can't make that transition into anticipation versus dreaming in reality. And once you start anticipating success, which is why success in winning is learned over time, it's not something that just happens. The anticipation of success is where athletes will start understanding how visualization is really important because there's an anticipation there of excitement. The difference on like a cellular level in your dopamine in your brain where most people struggle is if I were to put, you know, a poisonous snake in front of you and your heart were to beat, your hands would get sweaty and you'd get nervous and you'd get frightened and you'd get scared. That dopamine rush and on a cellular level, the difference in the response from your body is the same as if I were to put the crush you've had on for a year in front of you and you were about to have your first kiss where your palms get sweaty, your heart starts to race, you get nervous. The difference is, is you have an anticipation of a good outcome because the girl is in front of you. Therefore, you, you treat that mentally in your head as excitement. When the snake is in front of you, you anticipate a bad outcome where you are about to get bit right? Which turns it into a fear response. That's only depicted based on your anticipation of the desired outcome. The visualization comes into play when 
you can visualize a positive outcome with the result that can happen in front of you, right? When you can visualize a positive outcome, that response and the dopamine that you feel feels like excitement over fear. Most people, when they compete, they have a fear response because somewhere deep inside them, they know that other person can beat them. They do not truly believe that they are going to win this thing. It like they are on a stage to perform in order to win. Most people deep down feel like they're going to win. That's why when I was competing in 2016, I was relaxed as I could be in the semi. Like even though the guy beat me the last four times, they found me right before I walked out on the mat with my feet on a table, leaning back in a chair, completely relaxed because I anticipated winning. I understood I needed to have this opportunity in life in order to perform, in order to win, right? I cannot perform and win the medal I anticipated winning, which was a gold medal, without this fight. The difference is, is I am mentally prepared to win it. I am ready to win it. I expected this to happen and I am going to go do what I am supposed to do, which is win. More more often than not, what most people do subconsciously is they hope that that guy loses and that there's somebody else where they feel like they're always going to win that's in that place. When in reality, I wanted the fight, I wanted it to happen. So if you get nervous before you fight, there's a part of you that feels you're undertrained. Your conditioning and strength aren't really there. You have a fear of your family, you know, not supporting you. Your girlfriend's going to leave you because you're not successful. Your friends are going to laugh at you, right? When in reality, when I was going into 2016, I didn't feel any of those things. Whether I won or lost in 2016 didn't change the fact that the rest of the world saw me as one of the best judo players in the world at this weight class. Winning and losing didn't affect it. I was having a conversation with one of my athletes about this topic actually recently, and I told him, I said, when you compete, you feel like the world is going to judge you, right? Like if you were to lose this fight, everybody is going to think you're terrible at judo. I said, When I fight, when I walk into the cafeteria to get food, whether I win or lose, I know every one of these people know I'm one of the best in the world. And if I lost, it's because they think that guy got lucky, not I'm bad. Mentally, we are in two completely different realms of like how the world perceives us. And where a lot of people struggle is they visualize winning But on the internal side, they have a fear of losing. You can't visualize winning and have a fear of losing. It's like they're two contracting things that like they're not going to mesh well together. And back to the Connor scenario, like Connor can lose a fight and still tell the world he's one of the best. He's the best in the world because he believes it like internally in his soul. If you beat Connor McGregor, you got lucky. I'm still better than you, even though you beat me today. Overall, I'm still better than you are. And he believes that deep down, right? So when he anticipates winning, it's because he expects to win. So when he visualizes winning, the things are all coming together to help him get the desired outcome. Most people can't do that. That's powerful, man. It it, it seems like that kind of mindset is almost mandatory when you get to the to the upper echelons of of any sport. I mean, you have to have an unshakable confidence in yourself, you know? Some people do and some people don't. You know, some people like they can't they can't hack being the best in the world. They just can't do it. Some people want to be the underdog. So some people like myself, you climb to the top of the ladder and then you fall off of it. And then you climb to the top of the ladder again, because it's easier to fight knowing that the world thinks you're going to beat me. You know what? Fuck you. I'm going to prove you wrong. Here we go. And other people struggle at the number one, because they're like, 
oh fuck, I got to really prove I'm the best in the world again and again and again and again. I really changed my mindset when I didn't feel like I had to ever prove I was one of the best in the world because I, I, whether through self-talk or the community feel like the judo community agrees that I'm one of the best in the world, regardless of the result today, you can't take that away from me. And that's when beating guys like that is really challenging because no matter what you do, how good you are, how athletic you are, how scary your submissions are, how good your takedowns are, he already knows he's one of the best in the world. You're still trying to prove it, right? So he's got that leg up on that mental side where he's like, statistically, he's supposed to win. So good luck getting through that. And you have to climb that, you have to climb that roster. Yeah. That's really interesting what you just said about the position of the underdog being kind of a, a comfort zone in, in a lot of ways where you're kind of insulated for, for, in a way where, where you feel like, hey, you know, they expect this guy to beat me. So if I beat him, it's this huge upset and it's a huge cool thing. But if I lose, eh, it's kind of like, you know, people, people expected me to lose already. And you'll see a lot of guys with that mentality, like always settle around like, you know, seventh, fifth bronze, seventh, fifth bronze. Oh, I won one. Wait, seventh, fifth bronze, seventh, fifth bronze. They'll float around that like losers bracket where they're not going to main that like, hey, I'm in a final. 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 Because when you get to like metal podiums, you can't really determine who's going to win or lose on those days, right? It can flip flop. Sometimes you'll get like a one and two guy that'll always go back and forth, right? But like, that comes down to like who got injured during training, who didn't get a good night's rest. Like we compete all the time, right? But like the guys that struggle with that top mentality are like the guys that always like, you'll see them like beat somebody really good and then lose to someone really bad because they're really struggling with that. Like I can rise to the occasion because I can pull something out of me, but I can't maintain it. They need something to like help them get going. And it's a, it's a hard thing for them mentally to do. They haven't figured it out yet. Travis, John Danaher talked in the past about the idea of the illusion of competition, where basically he says, you know, when, when you get to big stages in, in, in any sport, or even if you go to like local tournaments, as, you, as you're working your way up the ranks, there's the there's the crowd, there's the lights, there's the uh, the cameras, if it's being streamed. Uh, if you're at ADCC, there's fireworks and things like that. How do you how do you typically remove the noise um, of big events. Like I, I could see where, you know, as an athlete's going along, they learned how to remove the noise of a local crowd or even TV cameras or, uh, uh, streaming cameras and things like that. When you get to the Olympics, you know, as a, as an Olympic silver medalist, how do you remove that kind of noise? Cause that's gotta be like just a different level of noise removal, uh, at least from, from my perspective. That, that all comes down to, you can't teach it. It's not, that's why winning is such like a learned trait for people when we're talking about competition, because when you, when you compete on stages like that, you always compete on stages like that. There's no like, this one's different than that one. Like when you're standing at the Paris Grand Slam and there's 30,000 people screaming and there's news cameras and news outlets and a hundred different photographers all watching you fight this guy from a foreign country. Like that's weird. Right. But like, it's also like, again, like I anticipate success. Like I'm, this is where I'm supposed to be. It's not, not supposed to be at a local high school with 500 people walking around a gym floor, like trying to compete. That's where I struggle with like, the IBJJF and like, should I go win a world title or not when I was an athlete? Cause it's like, I don't compete in that stage. That's, that's not where I excel at the pyramid with like all these random people walking around a mat with a couple of random photographers and like a weird bullpen with no real warm up mat and like no structure to like the event. Right. There's a big difference between going from that to going to an ADCC that's at the T-Mobile arena, which is where like I'm used to competing is like these big crowds, big stages, knowing that even if there was no one in the stands, the entire world is watching right now because they're curious to see who's going to win this event. 
So there's a lot of like, it's just a walk in the park. And that all comes from, again, just athletes when they first step onto the stage to as they start to like compete and gauge it, you just get comfortable with the idea of doing it, right? Like you're not going to get over public speaking because I'm going to give you a trick like, hey, picture everybody naked in the crowd. It'll make it easy. No, it's going to suck the first time you do it. You're probably going to get nervous. And then you're going to do it again and again and again. And it's just going to become part of like what you do every day that becomes normal. And if you choose to not compete that often, then guess what? It's like doing it the first time every time. You know, you either are going to be a competitor or you're not. And if you want to have one foot out the door and one foot in and compete twice a year, it's probably going to suck every time because you're always going to get nervous because it's not what you do. It's not who you are. But when you live and breathe it, like that's normal. It just becomes everything you do and it becomes who you are. And competing on stages where you go backwards actually becomes more nerve wracking because it's weird. That's a really cool perspective. I appreciate you sharing that. Travis, what do you think are some of the most destructive destructive examples of negative self-talk? And, and how does an athlete go from reversing that if it's become a habit? Because some people will talk to themselves in really shitty ways their entire lives. What do you think can be done to reverse that type of behavior in an athlete that just has, has a habit of doing it? <laughs> there's, there's two types of negative self-talk. The, f- the first one is internal. And the second is external. The internal one for me is, uh, okay, let me, it, it all has to do, before I say this, it all has to do with a perspective on like, where do you want to go? Like, what what is your goal when you're trying to, like what's your purpose for doing like let's use jujitsu or judo doesn't matter in this sport like if you come to me and you're like i want to go to the olympics wildly different than i want to win the olympics which is wildly different than i want to open up a school someday which is wildly different than i want to win the national championships all those answers put something into perspective with how good you need to be Right. And let's use, let's use a BJJ guy that wants to win the worlds as an example. Right. So I use the worlds because I'm referring to geeks. It's a little bit easier to explain in the geek because there's a ranking system. Right. And, and just put this and everybody can run this test. You're just in their local club. We're like, Walk up to a purple belt and ask them what move they're really good at. They'll give you an answer every time. Then take that answer and put it through the filter of like, well, if he's good at it, then where is that good in retrospect to good on the scale of where he needs to go? Right. So I'll use my judo player as an example. He just got back on a trip and we were talking and he goes, no, I'm getting really good at this move. And I went, well, first of all, you suck at it. So goods off the table. And he goes, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm really getting good at it. And I said, okay, let's put this on perspective. So that you understand where my brain is at. Right. I said, good is up here because you want to go to the Olympics. I said, okay. You are down here, right? I'm so okay. Regardless of how far that space is, I said, take that technique that you think you're good at and then take that skill that you have for that technique and apply it to this player. Does this player think he's good at it? Yes or no? And he goes, no. So I said, well, you want to be here, but you think you're good. How do you expect to improve to his level if you think you're good? I said, you can do something well in the moment, but your brain needs to tell you, I need to improve. I need to improve. I need to improve. I need to get better. I need to seek this out. I have to improve every day. The second you start going, hey, this is my move. 
it's like the biggest downfall for athletes because that talk hinders their ability to learn new things because they start identifying. And when they hit these roadblocks, it's like they've somehow at the lower level because they're down here have self-identified as like, well, this is what I do. And I'm like, but you suck at jujitsu. Like you suck at judo. Like you're trying to be the best in the world, but you keep using terms like you're good. I go, you could have gotten better. I'm getting better at it. Right. But I'm not good at it. Like I'm not where I need to be. I'm not there yet. I was one of the best judo players in the world. And I'll tell you there's techniques I'm not good at, but there's techniques I score with, but I'm not good at them. They only work because they fear the techniques I am good at, which makes it easier to do these techniques that I'm not that good at. So it works. But if my opponent is going to play 100% defense to these techniques I'm not that good at, I'm never scoring with them. I need him to make a mistake in order to get this technique to work because I'm not that good at it. But there are techniques I'm really fucking good at. And even if you play defense to them, I'm still scoring with them. Right. There's like levels to this and like a lot of, a lot of athletes who want to achieve something great. They, they don't really understand where they are. I told my whole school, I go, you guys all suck anyways. Just admit it. The second you admit it is the second we can start improving it because you guys are all colored belts. And that to me tells me you suck anyways because if you were really good at the sport, you'd either be winning world titles, you'd be making a couple hundred grand a year with Fanatics videos and a couple hundred grand a year competing. You'd have all these deals, but you don't. You're an average. Now you might be good for an average Joe weekend warrior. And if that's your goal, no problem. If you want to open up a school, yes, your technique is good enough to teach this to somebody else. And that's good enough for who you are and what you're trying to do. No problem with that type of talk for that type of player, right? But it's about putting it in perspective. Don't come to me and say, hey, I'm pretty good at this if I'm trying to achieve something way up here unless you are there, right? If you want to be good enough for a blue belt, perfect. Put that caveat on there. You want to be good enough for a master's competitor? No problem. Put the caveat on it. We're we're putting a ceiling on how much we can improve and how much dedication and time we're willing to put into our improvement with the words we're choosing to use. That would be like version number one. Version number two would be putting people onto a pedestal of struggling to break it down. You see it a lot with people that are fans of the sport where they're like, oh, so-and-so is really good. They beat so-and-so. They fucking didn't beat me. You can't be good. I am good. You're not good because I can spot every flaw you have and I'm going to exploit it and I am good enough to exploit it. And you, when you're a competitor, you have to have that mentality of like, you're not that good that you can't, you can't label them into this area of like, I'm really struggling And what you see is you see a lot of younger athletes that look up to higher level athletes with that mentality of like, oh, so-and-so is good. So-and-so is great. He's got a really good this. He has a really good that. And what happens is when it comes time for them to make that jump from the level they're here to competing with them, it's like competing against your big brother. You're already operating with a deficit and when you're operating under that deficit it makes it challenging to like overcome and what tends to happen is athletes can't crack that ceiling until the athletes who are holding up the ceiling are depreciating assets right they're depreciating in their athletic ability due to age their strength due to age like their mental capacity capacity to like keep going like if you've held a world title for like four or five years like you might just like mentally be like on your downslope 
with an athlete on their upslope, an athlete can start to overcome that. But if I'm 25 years old and I've got 10 more years and you already think I'm good and you've spent three years telling yourself I'm really good and then you jump on the circuit, it's going to be a challenge to like overcome that. So when you agree that an athlete can be good at something, right? Always have that like caveat of like, yeah, but if you do this, he can't do it anyway. So he's beatable, right? Don't, don't cut it short and be like, man, dude, that pitcher is amazing. No, that pitcher has a good fastball, but I'm going to hit his curveball and a slider. No problem. Right. Or yeah, that guy's really good in the first few innings, but he really dies off in the fourth. Right. You can start to like pick and choose and start to use talk that like, helps show yourself internally like where are you going to overcome the person you're trying to be while you're talking yourself through it where you're still like admitting that he has quality features but he's lacking over here and this is where I'm going to step in and how I'm going to win because I've recognized how I can exploit this individual instead of just like three years of like oh so and so is really good the fuck does that even mean good at what like, are they a good human? Are they a bad human? Is their conditioning good? Are they strong? Are they fit? Do they have good takedowns? Are they good against lefties or righties? Like, do they pass to the left as well as they pass to the right? Like, do they play bottom more than top? Like, what's good here? And once we figure out where they're good and where they're not, if we fight where they're not, I can win. And you start to, like, help yourself, like, develop this, like, long-term strategy on development and improvement because... You're not admitting you're like this type of player and you're this good and you maintain that ability of, hey, I'm always looking to improve. I'm always looking to get better. I'm always adding to my game and it's never good enough until I'm right where I want to be all the time. That's great. It almost sounds like a guide to avoid putting yourself into that underdog mindset we had earlier where you, you know, yeah, that's, that's really outstanding, man. I like that a lot. Um, Travis, what, what does the phrase winning breeds winning mean to you from the perspective of a coach? You know, it comes down to that, like, once you get comfortable winning, it becomes the like being able to anticipate and have that expectation of winning, which makes it easier because you're not trying to convince yourself you can win. You are expecting yourself to win. Right. There were years, I think it was like a year and a half or two years where I was on the circuit where like I knew I was fighting for a medal. We just didn't know what color it was going to be today. Right. So like when you have that like mental capability, you're like the getting involved in the tournament, getting through the rounds. Like even if you see somebody tough, like before you get into the medal rounds, you're like, nah, but I always medal. It'll be all right. This will be tough, but like, yeah be a headache but like yeah i got it i know what to do because i'm going to get through it because i internally like believe i'm getting a medal at set event i think there was like a year and a half two years where i I didn't medal at the world championships and like one or two other events in like an 18 month time span and everything else was we just had to figure out what color it was going to be and it, it helps it helps once you figure out how to win you can replicate it where you're like you're actually thinking about it and understanding it and anticipating it right you see that a lot with um, jujitsu where coaches will keep athletes back by their rank and they'll make them they're technically purple belts but they're competing at blue belt because they want them to get used to winning and then when they throw them at purple belt, they're still winning. And it's like, that's because you, you're you like back a rank from like where they really need to be. And it helps when they get to black belt because they know how to win now. So it helps them compete at that upper level versus like an athlete who's like never competed, jumps in at purple belt and like fights their way to the top, kind of gets like a good win. And the coach is like, hey, here's a brown belt, different skill set. They got to fight to get to the top. Here's your black belt. You fight to get to the top, like you're not, you don't truly believe and understand what winning can do for you. And that anticipation is not there because you haven't consistently done it enough. And so you always have that voice in the back of your head or like deep down inside you. That's like second guessing it a little bit. 
and it's hard to overcome. It is. It is building the the sort of the audacity to win is something that's uh, that, that that's really a, a struggle both for the athlete and for the coach to instill that in people, and it's uh, it, it is one of those tough things to crack. I, I, kind of on the same on the same idea, how do you manage an athlete who develops the habit of quitting? Because like there's always people who like psych themselves out and give up in the heat of the moment instead of fighting until the final second. What can be done from a coach's perspective to to fix something like that? Nothing. It's not your job, right? And where a lot of coaches really struggle is they try to wear all the hats at once. And it's like, you're doing, you're doing the athlete like a disservice, like stay in your fucking lane, like guys. And for all the people out here that are just like, jiu-jitsu athletes judo athletes like and you're trying to like reach the top i wholeheartedly believe this your coach whether it's judo or jiu-jitsu is not a fucking nutritionist for one not your fucking therapist for two they are not your strength and conditioning coach three like if you're using your jiu-jitsu coach your judo coach as your therapist your strength and conditioning person like you're setting yourself up for failure and you're just internally admitting you're not willing to invest in your success because you don't really think you can do it and there are some coaches that are like all hands-on like this is how i did it this is how we do it like you got to really do these like lifts because they're really like you know, identifying as the sport because it recreates this movement. Like the one thing I like about CrossFit is their number one philosophy is it makes you a better overall athlete, which is great for sports like judo and jiu-jitsu because the more athletic you are, the better you are at the sport. Problem with CrossFit is anybody can do it and it's very dangerous to have an untrained strength and conditioning coach with a weekend fucking certificate. But the concept makes sense, right? Of like, yes, you should not be trying to PR your bench. Yes, you should not be trying to PR your squat. You should be going to the gym to become a better athlete. If you are a better athlete, you can perform better at an athletic sport like a martial art. That's the number one thing you should be focused on, right? And it takes a professional to like... uh, I'll say this for strength and conditioning. If you walk into a gym and you hire a trainer and he didn't put you through like a measurement test of like where your mobility is, where your strength is, and didn't like put any numbers on paper and like measure anything, then leave and go get somebody else. Because now he's writing a program that has nothing to do with you and where you're at today with no plan on where you're going. Right. Like if you didn't have to reach down and touch your toes and check your mobility, like in a sport that requires flexibility, like just check out because he's not the guy for you or the girl for you. Right. Like seek out like professional help if you want professional results. Now, if you're a weekend warrior and you just want like the advice of your friend who is your jiu jitsu coach, then sure, no problem. Ask around, go because that's the result you're looking for. So it's all about putting things into perspective and being honest with where you are and like how much resources you're really trying to like dive into, right? Like if you have a professional strength coach that trains out of your academy and you're like, hey, my shoulder hurts, like what can I do? And he gives you some advice, take it if you're a weekend warrior. If you're a professional, don't even fucking ask the question because he's got to do a whole round of like, understanding when it got hurt, how it got hurt, what does the MRI look like? What did you undergo for surgery? What's your timeline to get back? Cause that has a lot to do with like what you can do. What have you been doing the past few weeks? When did you start therapy? There's this whole rigmarole of like, how do we get to the point of like what you need today in order to be where you are? Right. It goes back to the, you know, could you take a jujitsu athlete and get them to an Olympic medal? with enough time maybe but like probably not because there's a there's a timeline here of like 
Can that athlete learn what he needs to learn? Is he disciplined enough? Can he do these things? And we'd have to train four or five times a day, two or three hours each. And is he willing to commit to that schedule in order to go do this? Yes or no. The bigger your timeline, the less of a commitment every day. The shorter the timeline, the more of a commitment every day. And athletes struggle with that. And people struggle with that because they want professional results without <laughs> professional involvement. Yeah, it's a, com- it's a common thing I hear from coaches and instructors is that, man, I just thought I was going to be teaching jujitsu. I got people coming to me for like career advice and like like relationship advice. It's like, dude, how the hell did this? I was just trying to teach people arm bars and shit. Yeah. Like, like, you know, so it is funny how those hats sometimes, yeah, they, they, get, they get happily worn by some people who probably shouldn't be wearing them. And by others, they, they, they have a group of people that kind of expect it from them. So I appreciate you clarifying on that. I won't answer any of my athletes' questions. Yeah. Not my job. That's a Go good talk answer, to so and so. I think that's a very a responsible and professional answer for sure. Uh, switching gears here about a different topic, real fast, uh, Travis. I recently interviewed our mutual friend Sean Williams, and he quoted you saying that in judo, the black belt is seen as a level where you can sufficiently play the game. And I, and I really like that perspective. I, it really resonated with me when he when he quoted you saying that. It made me reflect on the ranking system in jujitsu too a little bit. And I'm curious, as someone who's a ju- uh, judo black belt and a jujitsu black belt, what are your thoughts on the ranking process and significance in BJJ? In what way? I guess the the, the value of the belt, uh, the the meaning of a black belt in jujitsu, as opposed to a meaning the meaning of a black belt in judo, just things along those lines. I think. I think a lot of things. Um, jujitsu has found a way to professionalize the black belt, where the community somehow I don't know why or how this happened if you see a guy in your gym wearing a black belt like you instantly feel like you know he knows what he's doing but on the same token you have people that are like well there's black belts but then there are black belts right and it's like which is it do the black belts know what they're doing or are there black belts and there are black belts? Right. And judo falls in line with like, yeah, a black belt doesn't mean, you know, everything in the sport. It means, you know, the basics. That's what it stands for. Jiu-jitsu, you know, has somehow monopolized the black belt to be like, well, you know, everything now. And and that's where I think it comes from the fact that jiu-jitsu decided to compete by rank more than like competing as a community because it segments skill based on the rank where jiu-jitsu segments knowledge by rank, which are wildly different things when you say that. Um, when you see a blue belt everybody assumes that this blue belt knows some realm of like this bit of knowledge and sometimes they come from different schools where it's like oh well they ignored this half of jiu-jitsu and they decided to teach that half of jiu-jitsu which is different than my half of jiu-jitsu and then when they get the purple belt they tend to like inverse right and they're like kitty corner until you get to black belt and you're like you understand all of it now to some degree and I don't think there's a right or wrong way to do it. I do lean more towards the judo side of like, no, you should, if you want to figure out who the best in the world is, like let everybody compete together. And I think that's why Nogi is so popular for the American people, because that's what we want to know. Like we don't want, we don't want to wait for a purple belt to get his black belt in five years because you decided that a black belt meant he needs to know everything or his coach feels like he knows enough to earn it in order for him to compete with that black belt who somebody somewhere said he knows everything, right? There's no like governing body of like, 
checking these boxes as they get their rank, just somebody somewhere agreed that like, here you go. And if that's really the case and there's no checkbox of like, why is this guy a purple belt? Because I thought toll holds weren't supposed to be taught until brown belt, but we have all these purple belt and blue belts competing and no gi learning heel hooks and toe holds. So like where the coach is like gauging this information from. And the more we go down this rabbit hole of like mixing the ranks and competing back to the whole development thing on learning, like, well, if he's really a purple belt, like why did you do heel hooks and toe holds? Why well, did that? Because I wanted him to compete on a professional setting without the professional rank. Got it. Now I'm confused. Right. And judo follows that logic of like, oh, you're a professional. Here's your black belt because you know it. I'm admitting you know it. Even though you still have more to learn, you are like the fact that you have a black belt in judo has nothing to do with the fact that you're not, you're still supposed to be learning when you get that black belt. It's the starting point to your journey where jujitsu treats it at the end. And then they don't allow certain people to compete in certain divisions because of it, which in my opinion, hinders the growth a little bit because the Americans want to know who the best is. And I think on a global scale, we want to know who the best is. And we don't want black belts being protected by their rank because that guy has a brown belt. It was one of the reasons why I like Copapodio so much, right? Because the brown belts were allowed to compete against the black belts for one of the first times ever. And like, it created a really good mix of flurries where brown belts were beating black belts, black belts were beating black belts, black belts were beating brown belts. But it was like, let's just let these guys are all professional athletes. Like, let's just let them compete. The only difference is, is some coach somewhere decided not to give some kid a rank and we're not all following the same rules with the rank. So why are we preventing these people from competing together? Right. So, you know, I, I will say this with a grain of salt, but if you're out there trying to learn takedowns, like a judo black belt is a beginner, just let that like sink in. We truly follow that logic of like, no, there are real judo players out there and then there are amateur judo players and then there are beginners. You know, like you gotta, you gotta be careful and you have to do your research and like, don't forget like national championships aren't that hard to come by in judo in the United States. Making a world team is like making your bed in the morning for us. Like you just had to like want to go. It's not really that complicated. Making a Pan Am team, not that complicated in the sport of judo. Winning a Pan Am medal, super easy because it's not that competitive. There's only three or four really strong countries, but there's only four medals given out. A gold, a silver, and two bronzes. So like getting one is like a walk in the park because that guy you had to beat for bronze kind of sucks in the realm of like what's good and what's bad. So when you hear people like, oh, I made three world teams or I made four world teams, like, well, how'd you do? Did you go 0 and 1? Did you go like 1 and 2? Like, did you fight for a medal? What was your world ranking ever and what was its highest peak? How many Grand Slam medals do you have? Like, you got to actually start looking at results and like where these people fall in line because our country allows people to just go. And when you do that, it's like, yeah, what if every black belt could put in their bio, like I'm a four time or a 30 time world team member for jujitsu, just because you registered to go. Like what weight would that hold in the jujitsu community? Zero, because we all know anybody can go. Well, for the U S that pretty much holds true too. Like anyone gets to go as long as you pay your own way and you get to go. So you have to be a little bit more diligent with like understanding where your information is coming from and how you're learning. Cause I see a lot of like fucked up things when people are teaching and I'm like, Jesus Christ, I can't believe that that even came out of your mouth. 
something interesting you said earlier, you were talking about Copa Podio and how we saw for one of the first times, uh, one of the rare instances of, of brown belts and black belts competing together in the same division. Especially in the gear. Yeah, exactly. And you know, that that's uh, that, that's precisely what I started reflecting on about your quote that, that Sean Williams said about, about the black belt in judo being seen as just someone that is now sufficient to play judo now. So not necessarily a master, but like you said, a beginner. Uh, because at, in jujitsu, ju ju one of the weird things about the rankings, especially nowadays, is that I feel like the advanced ranks are a lot of times at a pretty even level. Like I feel like it's it used to be back in the day that if a purple belt submit, submitted a black belt, it was like, oh my God, who is this kid? Where's he from? You know, get him an instructional. Nowadays, it's more like, yeah, okay, okay, yeah, purple belt caught a, bra a black belt. Like that, that's not super uncommon anymore. Brown belts catching black belts and vice versa, not super uncommon. So like you said, it, there is kind of a weird place where where it's, it's hard to measure sometimes what is considered to be like elite black belt and what's, you know, th th there's not really any distinction necessarily between elite world beater black belts and, you know, black belts that could be on par with any advanced rank really, you know? Yeah, it, you know, it all comes down to like, again, that hierarchy of like, what's your goal, right? If your goal is to compete, you're probably ranked a little differently than a guy who's like, Dude, I just want to teach and I want to own a school, which is probably ranked even differently than like, I just kind of want to show up and roll around, right? They're all like ranked and held to like different standards at the end of the day. Like nobody, nobody wants to pass out a black belt to a guy who's going to compete and get his ass kicked every time because he's not ready, right? They want to be competitive, which is at a higher level than a guy who's like, you know what? I just want to teach and I want to open up a school and this is what I want my life to be. And it's like, great. I need to make sure you can convey the knowledge. I don't even care that you can do it during a live training session, but you got to be able to like teach this stuff. So you have to be aware of it. You have to know about it and you got to be able to articulate it, right? Because not everybody has the athletic ability to do certain things. Doesn't mean you're not aware of it and you can't teach it, which is different than like, guy who's 50 years old he's been training for 20 years and he's just going to keep showing up and trying hard right they're all different and not everybody deserves ranks like i don't know there's something to be said about like where i come from of hey what is your goal is your goal to be a recreational player that just shows up to the gym and tries hard and when you get for me in jujitsu when you get to your ceiling yours you should get a black belt. But that's up for me to determine because I know you, I've seen you train, I've seen your ability to learn, I've seen your ability to roll. I understand you as a person and I think you're at your highest. Now you get a black belt because that's like the peak. It's your peak. It's not my peak because if we all went on my peak, all you fuckers would be turning in your ranks, right? Like, it, it would just be that's just the if i am the pinnacle of getting your black belt then all of you guys who are black belt should all turn your belts back in right so we're we're using some sort of like personal gauge on somebody's personal development and growth and aspirations already it's just never really been talked about and i think that's where that ranking system kind of has to have a little bit of flux flexibility in it where it makes sense to have that flexibility if we throw all the ranks into one division at a time and let them compete. You know, where you split it between like allowing people to go like, I'm a beginner, I'm an expert, like a Nogi style where like I'm an intermediate and you just let them kind of like figure it out. Like what's the difference between a four stripe blue belt and a fresh purple belt? really like why we, what are we doing what's the difference between a two stripe purple belt and a four stripe blue belt do they even in the gi compete under a different rule set you know like w what are we doing with this rank gap here on why we're not making a division of 60 people to figure out who the best is when we decide to split it down the middle and say no nah, we're going to do two divisions of 30 right like why did we do that or not me because i wasn't a part of that decision because i wouldn't have been okay with that but 
Like that's how we're gauging the sport. It helps facilitate the growth because everybody gets a medal and everybody feels good, you know, but again, like I think the American population would rather see like events being structured in like uh this is a really competitive series. This is like a grassroots series, kind of like a baseball, like these are travel teams. These are local. These, these teams don't play together, right? You are a professional competing in this environment you are a recreational person and you guys won't fight. So you don't have to worry about a professional blue belt fighting a recreational purple belt getting wrecked because he wrestled D1 in college. And this guy has two kids and he's 35 years old or, you know, he's been doing jiu-jitsu for a little bit and he's 24 years old with no martial arts or combat sports background. Getting wrecked by a blue belt with a year of experience and a D1 athlete. You know, like, there's levels to this. Travis, I'll tell you what, man, we've reached a point of the show. I always play a game with my guests. It's called the pummel. You've played it before. Uh, basically for the people new to the show, the pummel is a series of random questions. Some of these are about jujitsu. Some of them have nothing to do with jujitsu, but Travis, if you'd like to run through the pummel with me again, I'd love to play this with you again. We can try. Let's see what happens. All right, all right man. I've added a couple new questions since you've been on question. Number one, what's the largest animal you think you could beat in hand to hand combat? Oh, that's a tough one. Ah, <laughs> uh, a monkey. A monkey. Okay. Now, now, you have to be specific. Are we talking like a little spider monkey? Are we talking about a chimp? Where in the spectrum of monkeys are we, uh, are we landing? My brain was like definitely smaller than an orangutan. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> definitely smaller than a chimp. Not a gorilla. Okay. okay. Something that like is like 50 pounds, 60 okay. pounds. I think that's right. my bet. Okay, cool, cool. I like that. Maybe like a that. baby monkey. A baby monkey. That's a good one. Yeah. Have Travis. That would be a good pay per view event. We were talking about like pay per view judo events. Travis versus baby monkey. That would be. Yeah. That would be a solid card. <laughs> Travis, what do you think? If you could, if you found a genie lamp uh, and you could have three wishes, uh, standard genie rules apply. So no killing people and no wishing for more wishes. What would you uh, wish for? Um financial freedom good one or any stage the world is at um long life so not forever but long long and healthy um and i don't have a third one let's keep it in the pocket keep keep keep, yeah. keep it for when you need it yeah that's a good that's a good move. like the world would change over like a hundred years and you'd have to like think of something new <laughs> you need that new one yeah you're gonna need that especially if you have the long healthy life if you're like a semi-immortal and a couple hundred years has gone by you might want to wish for something different for sure so that's 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 wise uh what do you think is a secret talent that you have that people might not be aware of oh uh, I don't think I'm that talented. I don't do that much during the day. Um, I'm a below average athlete. I don't know about that, but okay. <laughs> um, I don't think I have any talents. No, you to don't be play honest. cook or sing or dance or play instruments or anything. No, no. I don't cook. I eat out. I don't sing. I don't play any weird sports don't have a lot of hobbies um yeah i'm pretty average now that i think about it <laughs> nothing special fair enough i appreciate that i like that what's something you wish you were better at if you if you could if you could have like an like a like a superb talent in anything what, what would you wish for uh either golf Okay. Just because I think it would be fun to just do something on a whim that people try really, really hard to do. And I think it'd be funny to just randomly be good at it. <laughs> um, be card counting. Card counting. Yeah, dude. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the mafia is not so prevalent in Vegas anymore. It's mostly corporations now. So like the, the consequences aren't so scary. It's more just like you get kicked out rather than having your thumbs broken off. So that'd be, that'd be fun. <laughs> Counting cards. I like it. What do you think is um, the worst injury you've ever had? Uh, define worse. 
uh, Bears long, night. most Bible. chronic. Yeah, like most chronic, Bo- most 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 debilitating, most chronic, most difficult to get around. Um, I'd probably have to put that into two. My my neck injuries are pretty chronic. I don't feel them day to day, but they also can't leave, so I'm always at risk. And the infection I got in my leg in 2015 is actually a deteriorating thing. So like my knee is going to have to go a full replacement in the next few years. And there's no like if, ands or buts from it, but it wasn't like an injury. It's an infection. It doesn't quite qualify, but it might. That's yeah. I'm sorry to hear that you have to get it replaced, man. You told you told that story the first time I ever interviewed you, I believe, and yeah. it was to this day one of the one of one of the reasons why if I see any slight bump on my skin, I'm like, dude, hospital, like now, like going, <laughs> like I need I, to, I need to get antibiotics immediately. Yeah, yeah. Even today, I can't um, I can't pivot on my foot without my knee popping. Jeez, I can't yeah. put my knee on the ground without feeling like my kneecap is like slipping slightly. And I get like a sharp pain. So it's it's definitely deteriorating faster than I would have thought. But that was all par for the course. Man, well, I hope uh, I hope everything goes smoothly with when you do need to replace the knee. I hope uh, I hope it all goes smoothly. Luckily, you're you're in a good time historically to have something like that done. I think medical yeah. technology is better than ever. So and I probably I have like five years before I need to do it. It really depends on how active I am. The more active yeah. I am, the faster it deteriorates. Yeah. Yeah. What what do you think is your favorite bad food to eat? Favorite junk food? I mean, it's all I really eat. So (laughs) I'm a big proponent of like sweets. So like Reese's peanut butter cups, uh, cookie dough, ice cream. Uh, Those would probably be my two favorite. Yeah. Reese's Reese's are definitely a vice, man. Those are one of my favorites. I, I I have to be very careful if I start allowing myself to eat those. I'll start I, once I start, I don't stop. So I, I, I can I can relate on that for sure. Um, what do you think is your uh, who's your favorite MMA fighter of all time? Um, I'd probably say GSP. Good choice. Probably just because he was one of the like. I think few that had a background, but then like was more dominant in a non background specific portion of the sport. Cause he was really known for his ability to like time shots and do takedowns and then keep people on the ground, which has nothing to do with like his karate style background. So I think he was pretty good at like, Hey, I'm really good here. Let me really learn this and get really good. And then we'll marry the two together to be a well-rounded fighter instead of like, Hey, I'm really good here. I'm just going to come in with it and I'm going to continue to do it. And then like a Ben Ashgren, it's like, I'm really good at wrestling. I'm just going to take you down and then hold you there. Yeah. yeah. GSP for sure. One of the greatest of all time. No question about that. Um, what do you think is your biggest phobia? Oh, uh, spiders and snakes, maybe spiders and snakes. Yeah. Yeah. I don't like heights. I hate heights. Oh, heights really? Okay. One, two. But it has to be like a, an unforeseen height. Like if I'm on like a stable platform, like the top of a building, I'm fine. You put me six inches from the edge of the top of a building with nothing to hold me up. Now I'm scared. Yeah. But it has to be like, uh, this could go bad. Remember that whole like fear, like anticipation thing? Like yeah. I could fucking see this going south. Like I don't like this. <laughs> There's things that could happen here that could go. Yeah, that I just don't like. Huge wind gust. (laughs) What do you think is an embarrassing song that you secretly like? Uh, I Feel Like a Woman by Gretchen Wilson. (laughs) See, dude, when you're an Olympic silver medalist, you can just admit stuff like that. I envy that. (laughs) That's awesome. (laughs) What do you think is your most hated food? What's something you cannot eat no matter what? A salad. salad. I'm just gonna label the whole thing into a thing. I don't do salad. I don't okay, really do enough. greens. Really? Really? No vegetables? No vegetables? Or, or are you talking about leafy, like leafy salads? Uh, you know, I'm a respectful guest. So if you give me a salad and like, oh, here this is, I made this, I'll eat it. I will never order it. 
if there are greens on my dish at a restaurant, I will ask them to be replaced. If you serve it to me though, and I didn't like get a choice of like picking it, I will not eat it. Like if we're at a dinner table and there's like a stack of peas, I'm not touching it. If there's like a salad, I'm not touching it. If you give me the plate with it on it, I'll eat it. I'll never order water and I'll never order vegetables. Wow. What do you drink? What do you drink mostly besides water? Coffee and soda. Coffee and soda. I only drink water when I train, which is basically never. Oh my God, dude. What do you think is your prized possession that you have? I mean, this is going to sound bad when I say it because it's not really a possession, but I'd say my wife. Yeah. Okay. I feel you. Not really a possession, but like, you know, she keeps everything together for me. So like, Without her, like everything kind of falls apart, but not a possession, but I'm going to go with it. No, that's a good answer. Something, something, something that's in your life. That's very valuable to you for sure, man. That's a great answer. Uh, who's your favorite superhero? I don't watch a lot of superhero movies. Um, Do you read comics as a kid or anything like that? Nope. I played sports. I was an outdoor kid. Unlike the kids of today. Um, (laughs) I'll throw that in there. <laughs> uh, who's the guy from Guardian of the Galaxy that wore the goggles and shot the thing? He's a real smart ass. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I'd go with uh, that guy. Okay, right. Smart ass. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> if you could have a superpower, what would you choose? What's the wizard that does the thing with his hands and like goes like places where he wants to go and can like move things? Doctor Strange, he did Doctor the Strange. Doctor Strange. Doctor Strange. With the hands. Yeah. Yeah. That would be that'd cool. Be cool. That would be cool. That would be cool. Doctor Strange type powers. Those would be good for sure. I don't know if that can constitute a superpower. Oh, yeah. A no, totally. I don't know. Totally. No, I feel man, like totally. that's a comic debate waiting to happen. <laughs> I know. Yeah. It's going to be a, you're going to get a whole, lot, whole lot of those indoor kids flooding the comments uh, to yell at you. Yeah. Guys. Like, <laughs> if you pick up Thor, did you pick up <laughs> Thor's hammer? Like, I don't know, man. <laughs> If you could pick um, a historical figure that you would have liked to meet, who would it have been? George Washington. Good choice. Good choice. Excellent. What would you have asked him? To be honest, I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall when like the war started to be like, where is this going? Yeah. And like, what are your thoughts on like, we're about to do this fucking thing. Here we go. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. That would have been a crazy moment to get to witness. What's your favorite place in the world outside the U.S. that you visited? Germany. Do you still still go back to visit at all or not really? No, I haven't been there in years, years. But now I've traveled so much that like, I really don't want to leave. I'd rather stay home. Like I'm definitely like a staycation kind of person. Most people haven't like gotten out and like been to like the nice beaches of the world like the alps like different places in paris england like all these places been there done that i'd rather stay home final question for the pummel game travis uh if a zombie apocalypse breaks out right now in in uh, massachusetts what's the first thing you do kids family guns knives food supplies car Good answer. I feel I feel like you've thought about this before. I feel I feel like <laughs> don't correct me if I'm wrong, but it feels like you might have played out this scenario before. <laughs> you just gotta go on the hierarchy. Kids can't do anything themselves, so you gotta grab them first. Wife can fend for herself, then you've gotta find her, then you've gotta get the supplies to keep everybody with you, then you've gotta get the stuff to keep them alive, then you've gotta get the vehicle to get away from danger. Like you gotta go with that like hierarchy just real quick. That's very good. That's an excellent initial zombie apocalypse hierarchy for sure. And Travis, that was the final question for the pummel game. Congratulations. You win again. You got your double underhooks. <laughs> Travis, just a couple more questions for you, man. So uh, we were talking earlier about how, how, how conditioned and well, how well conditioned judo athletes are across any sports. And as we said, for anyone that's ever locked up with an elite judoka, you know what, you know what we mean by that. In your opinion, what types of strength and conditioning exercises are most relevant to grapplers? The sport. The sport itself. Yeah. You just, and like I tell my athletes this all the time, like when you're injured, you there's nothing you can do that's going to get you in shape for the sport. So don't think of strength and conditioning as like, this is strength and conditioning that's going to make me this. 
strength and conditioning is there to make you a better athlete. What's going to get you really, really strong is actually fighting within the sport. That like human interaction and that push and pull and the fighting with another human that is equally as mentally strong as you and equally as physically strong as you. That's how you're going to get strong. The rest of it is just circumstantial. Like there's obviously, you know, some bit of like starting point, you know, like I have an issue. There's been like an Instagram clip like floating around of like, I think he trains at Legion or like they call themselves like American Jiu Jitsu or something where they're like, we don't do warm ups. People don't pay for warm ups. So they can get right into Jiu Jitsu. And it's like, to some degree, I get it, but like, when you have a guy that's walked through your academy and like he struggles to touch his toes, like he can't do push ups, he's never done an athletic thing in his life, like part of that warm up is like basic human conditioning and function that like you kind of need to do in order to participate in the sport. Like not everybody can like lay on their back put their feet close to their butt and pick their hips up for longer than a couple seconds. Like you gotta like, not everybody walks in the academy that's like, hey, yep, I'm athletically healthy. I used to go to the gym and I'm ready to go. So you need to have that like base level of fitness before you can start. And you should have, every athlete should supplement their training with some bit of strength and conditioning because it's gonna help prepare your body to do battle within the sport, right? You don't want that to be your base level. You want a base level outside of it, you're bringing in. So like when I was doing all my strength and conditioning, it was about maintaining a really high base in the gym so that I bring that base to the sport and I excel up from there rather than the other way around. I don't bring like a 350 pound bench into the judo room and try to apply it to the techniques. I bring my bench into the gym where I'm healthy, happy, and I can function. Then I take that function and I apply it as much as I can inside the sport. Now, now for people that do want to add some weight training uh, to help to help reach that kind of point, what, what do you think are some of the most beneficial exercises that can be done? If you had to pick just a couple to start with, what, 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 what gave you the most benefit in the weight room, do you think? Um... Benching would be one, um, but it would be a, a narrow grip bench, not closed, but like just outside the shoulders. So you're using more your your lats and your triceps than your chest because we, we function in a push-pull environment. Um, yeah, I was thinking like for break, like breaking grips, that would be the kind of the kind of muscle group you'd be using. Also, keeping somebody like at distance from you, like being able to like hold this for like extended periods of time, because sure. they're they're yeah. actively trying to pull you, so you're you need to be able to brace that out yeah. under weight, which is basically holding a bar inside that position, right? Um, and I think anything where. I think in like a, a broad spec, regardless of the lift, because they're all somewhat important, it would be going from a stable platform lift to an unstable platform lift and inverting those back and forth within your conditioning to make sure that you're becoming well round well round well rounded. Yes. Very well rounded. Yes. That was a tongue twister. <laughs> right. So like as an example, like when I say bench, like my brain instantly goes to like, yes, we do like bar benching, but then we also do dumbbell benching because it creates that instability in the shoulders that help tighten everything. And then we go from there to like kettlebells with like the weight on the outside, which makes it a little bit more challenging where you're using all the little muscles as well as the big muscles where like, I don't want people thinking like, well, he said bench, so I'm just gonna start walking bench and ripping it out. And it's like, no, you gotta think about it in like a holistic aspect of like, we use all different angles. So like you want to be able to like use independent weights, but you also want that bar structure to like help get a little bit stronger. So like always pairing things back and forth. Like if you're going to do a deadlift, do like an RDL, like don't just like focus on your back, use single leg movements as well with the same style of exercise. Did you have a particular lower body uh, exercise that you felt was real beneficial as well? 
the single leg deadlift works well. RFEs work well paired with like an actual deadlift paired with like an actual rack pull where you're doing like the four together um, during different stages of your strength and conditioning. So like your rack pull is going to be your higher level, like big explosive heavy lift. Your deadlift is going to be your full range. Then your RDL is going to use all the stabilizing muscles and feet, hips and knees in order to tighten everything up that you got from the rack pull and the deadlift. So being able to like work through all four, like consistently will help get you to be like a well-rounded, well-balanced grappler. Same thing with like hang cleans to like swings, right? Single leg, single, or I'm sorry, single arm, two arms, then bar to like, again, working those like individual muscles little by little. That's excellent, man. I appreciate your insight on that. Cause yeah, I think a lot of people that want to start adding strength and conditioning to their, to their training sometimes just don't know where to start. So having someone like yourself that's been there and done it is always appreciated. So body weight is always the best place to start. Yeah. So yeah, plyometrics. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 I asked Shintaro the same question, but I, I'd be interested in hearing your answer as well. What do you think is the most underutilized technique in, in judo technique that could be really effective in jujitsu competition? Now I'm curious to see what his answer was. <laughs> I'll tell you after. An underutilized judo technique in jujitsu. Considering all judo techniques are jujitsu techniques, that's a challenge. Um, Something you see common in judo, but not, not yeah. very common at all in jujitsu. Common sense when you're on your feet. I don't know. Um, All right. Well, now you're just hurting my feelings, Travis. It's hard because jujitsu is dynamically so different from like your competitive black belts to like your local recreational guys working out, like just how the sports are done. It's hard to quantify like what would be good just generally all the way around. Um, I think, I think if I were to just generalize it, I'd say control of the grips over like an actual like throwing technique or a guard pass or a control position. I think just our ability to hold the gi in a way that controls an opponent, whether we're on the ground or on our feet is just far better than anything that like a jujitsu player would do but shintaro said uh tomoya and yeah uh, and then all, and then also trailing foot sweeps he had a trailing foot sweep as a, as a secondary as a secondary thing that he thinks could be really effective in jujitsu for that most people would not see common yeah and I, I the more i think about like techniques i like i don't even teach techniques like that in my school because i'm like once the guy knows you do it you'll never do it again because they're just going to pull guard. So it's like, how, how effective is it really? Right. But the one thing like a judo person can do, especially with like the strength in their hands, because they do it. When I grab your sleeve, you will not be able to grab mine. When I grab the collar, like I can have so much control over your body and like what happens where you can go that most jujitsu people don't consider because they think about all the secondary things they can do with their feet and their hands and the collars that they forget how to use their actual hands in order to facilitate control over their opponent. Like the wrist movements, the rolling, the, the hand placements. That to me would be like from a high level, like what's really, really valuable. It's a great answer. Yeah, it's a great answer. In fact, you know, your, your instructionals you, you have with us here at BJJ Fanatics, one of my favorite instructionals I've watched across the board of, of all of them is uh, your, your grip fighting series that you showed. You, I, think, I think that you, sh you, you put together a great systemized map of how to grip fight and, and, and hand fight well. And for anyone out there that's looking to add that to your game, you guys definitely got to check it out. Yeah, you're thinking of that like Kazushi one where I show yes. like how to use your wrist and your hand. I remember when I was done with that, John Carlo was like, so you're going to do part two, right? Like, and actually show the takedowns. And I was like, dude, I don't know, man, that's a lot of work. <laughs> and then Mike's been trying to get me to do it. And I'm like, dude, that's hours of work, man. There are so many 
variations and like, you got to do it, man. You got to do it. There's no, there's no reason not to. It's only going to be there's a lot of reasons not to. <laughs> Besides, you it don't would, feel like it. That's not, uh, come on. It would take me like 20, 30 hours just to like write the content. And that's what people don't understand is like, when we're on our feet, like, well, if the guy is three inches shorter than you, it changes how you do the throw than if he's three inches taller than you. And then both of those things change when it goes from left-handed to right-handed. Then that same throw changes again if you go from sleeve control versus collar control, right? So you just took one technique and you multiplied it by 10 times how many different techniques you could possibly do. Like the, the, the list would be so fucking astronomically long that like, I don't think anybody would like digest it. And like the shooting of it would be so complicated because if, if you try to get a right-handed player who starts right foot forward to move like a person who starts left foot forward, it's not going to work because they don't actually move in the right way or react in the right way. So you'd actually have to get like four different ukes, like one shorter, one taller, one left, one right on both. So yeah, you need four different people because you need a short lefty, a tall lefty, a short righty, a tall righty. Then you'd have to play with like weight differentiations because if you can't control the weight, you have to do it slightly different than if you can, which has a lot to do with like your own personal strength. So there's a lot of like variation on the feet, which is why judo is a better like athletic development because you have to play with all these variabilities. If you take a six-year-old kid and you give him somebody who's taller, he can throw a kid easier because like the leverage points above it, right? But if you give him somebody who's shorter, now he's physically got to squat, pick the kid up and then throw him, which is athletically more challenging than if they are just standing there. And as coaches, you, you have to play with all those different variables for judo. But yeah, it would be astronomically long. We, we can go to central casting. We'll get you four ukis. We'll get you what you need. Come on, man. Do part two. We need you to do this. The, oh. the, the, the fact that you can break it all down this way and get so deep with it, that's what that's, that's what people want. Let's get this done. Because right? well, your, your first one was so good, man. It helped me a ton. I remember I typed it up with Mike where we focused only on like a Sayanagi and like a two foot sweeps. And the list was 1,300 videos. Oh, my God. It was like oh an astronomical like thing. And I remember sending it to him. And he was like, well, could we break it up into parts? And I'm like, not really. Like, they kind of like, it's all like spider web together. Like, when you're doing it, because it's feel and function at the same time. Like, it's, it's a big to-do. And that was like a... That was just a brain dump on like, I'm just going to type this out. And yeah, I think it took me like three or four days to type out and then we didn't do it. And we just stuck to the gripping one because the gripping one wasn't so physical. Like I would have to go to the gym for like three months, do cardio to like shoot even 300 video clips where like I have to pick up a human five or six times per video and throw them to the floor. Like if you think about like, I've got to get up and off the ground five times per video, that's at 500 videos. And assuming I only did it five times, that's 2,500 step ups and 2,500 lifts of a human being. So go to the gym, put 200 pounds on a dead, on a deadlift and do it 2,500 times and then do 2,500 step ups. Like j go there, do it. And then tell me shooting videos is easy. Well, man, we'll get you back on water. We'll get you on water again. We'll get you your own bubbler. You guys call them bubblers up in Boston. We'll get you, we'll get <laughs> yeah. your own bubbler in the studio. We got to make it happen, man. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to keep pestering you until, until we eventually get you on a filming schedule. But either way, guys, if, if, if you haven't seen Travis's first instructional that we're talking about, check it out. He's got several others as well. BJJFanatics.com. Type in his name. Uh, Travis, man, really enjoyed the conversation, brother. What are some of your major goals for 2024? What are some things you hope to accomplish by the end of the year? Watch the Olympics. Yeah. Yeah. That's going to be good. And, huh? Yeah. That's my, that's my main one. Like I'd like to be like ahead enough in work where like, I can put the TV on and pay attention. Yeah. 
I'm trying to figure out how to watch it. I was actually just looking at that last night. I was trying to look for like the wrestling and judo and boxing schedules. Um, and of course, the, you know, some of them are like really early in the morning or really late at yeah. night. But I think you have to have NBC's app in order to watch I it. I think so, so, yeah. Yeah, so I'll have to figure all that out. But yeah, it's going to be, it'll, it's always fun to watch. You know, anything else, anything else on, on, your, on your goal list for the year besides, besides tuning in to the Olympics? No, nah, that's really it. Keep it simple. Keep nice. it achievable. <laughs> I love it, man. That's awesome. Well, folks, unfortunately, we're fresh out of time. Travis, it is always a pleasure getting to talk with you, man. I appreciate you being so patient while I sit here and pick your brain for almost three hours. Uh, you're always welcome back on the show anytime you want to come back. Thanks. Happy to do it. For anyone out there that wants to keep up with Travis, it's real easy to do so. He's active on all platforms of social media. Uh, Facebook, it's Travis Stevens, U.S. Judo Athlete. That's his page. You can follow him there. Instagram is Judo Silencer. Make sure you guys follow. He puts lots of good content up. Speaking of great content, his YouTube channel is awesome. Just type in Travis Stevens. You'll find his channel. Subscribe and hit the little bell icon to get notified when he adds new videos. Uh, if you guys are interested in learning about his, uh, his, his, uh, his efforts with Jimmy Pedro through the American Judo system, go to AmericanJudo.com. Um, really cool stuff that they're doing. Check that out. And then of course, guys, uh, if you're ever traveling through Boston, drop into the Fuji gym. It's one of the most premier academies in the whole country. So drop in, get some good training. If you can't make it to Boston, you can learn from Travis anywhere in the world here at BGJFanatics.com. He's got several instructionals with us. Go check him out. And that's going to do it for this episode, everybody. I really appreciate you tuning in. Please stay tuned for the next episode of the BGJ Fanatics podcast.